Good evening all and welcome. Before tonight's video begins, I have a quick announcement. A few months ago, I announced that I was making a coffee and I did. It's a platform where you can donate a small amount of money every month. Uh, and what I've done with my wife is create a series of interviews to get to know the real Mort. And it's actually pretty cool. If you want to check it out, I'm going to leave a link at the bottom of the description. You also get other rewards for signing up. There's a new reward every week. You know, more interviews, other digital stuff that you can download. So yeah, feel free to check that out if you want. But without further ado, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I live in Adelaide, South Australia. I moved to the city from a small country town with my partner, Mrs. Brajaka, roughly 10 years ago now. We moved into a small two-story townhouse with another friend. It was a really nice place, clearly an older building, but the interior had been modernized. Everything started off okay. Our friend took the master bedroom, which came with a walk-in wardrobe, while we took the room next door. Both bedrooms and a bathroom were up on the second floor. Under the stairs was a small broom cupboard. We didn't use it much at first, because for some reason, it was extremely cold in there. Nothing could heat it up, not even a heater. We assumed there must be a hole leading to the outside somewhere, and left it at that. It was about a month into living there when the first weird thing happened. I was home alone sitting downstairs with the TV on quietly while I read a book and I heard my name. I looked at the TV thinking that someone on there must also be named what my name is. But no, nobody on that episode of Scrubs was called that. Out of sheer curiosity, I turned the TV off and listened intently. Nothing. So I figured it must have been my imagination. And then I went to turn the TV back on. As I pressed the power button, I heard my name again. The voice was definitely coming from upstairs. I believed since I was a kid due to other experiences. But this really got my hairs on end. I called Mrs. B and asked when she would be home. Not until tomorrow. I'm staying at my mum's tonight. Our other housemate was also away. I turned the TV back on, raised the volume and found some blankets in the cold cupboard and slept downstairs that night. The name calling continued on and off for a few months. But our other housemate never heard it. In fact, she didn't believe in anything paranormal and thought I was making it up. Mrs. B did and agreed there was something else in that house. Not long after, our housemate moved out and we took over the master bedroom. A few days later, a handyman came to install a TV antenna plug on the wall downstairs. To get the wires through the wall, he had to get into the crawl space upstairs. It was around lunchtime, and we had an awesome takeaway place just round the corner. I let the guy know I was ducking out for 10 minutes or so to grab food, and left him in the crawl space. When I got back, I found him downstairs confused. Did you come back five minutes ago and call my name? He asked. Uh, no, I said and he explained that he heard the door open and close, and then his name was called. He chalked it up to my next door neighbor, but I knew that wasn't it. The real terror began about a week after that. I came home from work at about 8 p.m. when Mrs. B was working late and couldn't be home until midnight. But when I walked into the back door, I distinctly heard her call my name from upstairs. I called back that I didn't think she'd be home yet, and made my way up. Opening the bedroom door, I instantly realized that it was not Mrs. B who called me. A wave of hate burst from that room and hit me like a ton of bricks. Never before and never again have I felt a presence like that. Whatever the hell it was, it didn't like me at all. I quickly got changed and took a look around the room. 
The walk-in wardrobe had a white curtain for a door, and I closed it every morning when I left the house. It was wide open now. I raced back downstairs, left the house, and went to the pub. I met Mrs. B at home when she finished, and told her what happened. She didn't believe me at first, but when she saw how terrified I was of our room, she realized I wasn't lying. The hate in the room was gone, but I could still feel something. We went to bed, and I closed the curtain, and I swear I could feel eyes on me. I slept on the side of the bed furthest away from it, and in the morning the curtain was open. We lived in that house for a few more months, and I never experienced this hate in that same sensation again, until our final day in the house. But there was still something there, something that didn't want me. I put all my clothes in the spare room, so I wouldn't have to go into the walk-in wardrobe, because that's where whatever it was felt strongest to me. It was also the location of the crawl space hatch. Friends have heard the voices calling out sometimes, but no one else felt the presence like I did. The day we moved out, I was the last one there. As I was checking over all the rooms and locks for the last time, I heard my name. I shivered but ignored it this time and kept doing what I had to do. I checked the last lock and walked out of the house for the last time. I got into my car, looked up at the master bedroom window, and I swear without a doubt, there was a woman up there glaring at me. That feeling of pure hatred hit me for the last time, and I floored it out of that street and never looked back. Mrs. B to this day doesn't believe me about that, because she didn't see it. I can appreciate the need of seeing to believe, but I know what I saw, and I hope I never see it again. This story takes place when I lived on my old property. I was a little boy, maybe eight or nine. You see, the cul-de-sac I lived in was a fairly nice neighborhood, nothing crazy. My room was across from my parents, just down a long hall and next to my sister's room. My brother and I shared rooms and a bunk bed. Everything was fine until my sister reached her teen angst phase. Then came the doll. It was a creepy looking porcelain doll with a black tutu and had a punk rock kind of motif, and she loved it. She got it from her godmother, a woman we no longer speak to. My brother and my mum and I never liked the thing because it gave us the creeps, but hey, it was her doll. However, slowly but surely we began to see a change in her. She was beginning to become more reclusive and angry with my mother for no reason at all, and even cut herself in front of me once. Weird, yes, but nothing quite supernatural. Then she began to sleepwalk. At first, we thought it was normal, maybe just stress from being a teenage girl. I don't know. But she started to creep me out. And because of this, I began to lock the door at night after my brother fell asleep. And on one of these nights, I heard her get up from her bed and slowly walk. I was in my top bunk, mind you, watching under the door when I saw her shadow. See, as my room is across from my parents, I couldn't tell if she was standing there in front of my room or my parents, but it was still very creepy, and she stood there for an unnatural amount of time. On the last occasion, we all awoke one morning to a knife under my parents' bedroom door, and this just made them flip out. They weren't scared, they were more concerned about my sister being nuts, and homicidal, since she'd been acting so strangely. Things went on for a little bit, until one day the doll disappeared, and my sister came out furious, huffing and puffing, but no one in the house seemed to have an inkling about its disappearance. And so, life went on, and I never knew what happened to it, until I asked my dad about it years later, and he enlightened me. It turns out that my godmother was heavily into black magic and Santeria, and had a deep hate for my mother over some petty squabble they had before my father and mother were married, and held a deep resentment for her. 
I guess firstborn females of the family, is important in Santeria. And so, when she saw an opportunity, she gave my sister that horrible doll we hated. But what actually happened to the doll was the funniest part. My mum is super religious, and I guess at some point, she had soaked the doll in holy water and left it in the trash for the garbage man to take out to the dump the next day. Another funny thing, my sister never sleepwalked again. It was the 4th of July, a Thursday, and my roommate and I decided to go for a bicycle ride. Wednesday happens to be my day off, but since my job does not open for the holiday, I worked that Wednesday. So I would have the same amount of hours for that pay period. I thought it would be nice to go out. After all, I also had two free movie vouchers. My roommate has a pickup truck, making it convenient to carry our bikes. We head to an area that is about 30 miles from where we live. It's a beautiful upscale community that has nice roads and the gorgeous scenery that South Florida has to offer. Before I continue, I must sidetrack information to the listener. My boss's dad has recently left on a week long cruise with his wife. At a certain point during their voyage, he tripped and fell. This caused him excruciating pain and as a result, his family took him to the doctor where he was given horrible news. He had cancer, and it had spread throughout his body. For some unknown reason, the doctors never caught up to his illness during his regular checkups. Things deteriorated rapidly after that. Last thing I knew, he was being transferred to a different hospital, from West Palm to Miami. I must admit, I'm not that crazy about old people. They can be bitter and complain a lot. However, my boss's dad was a sweetheart and a joker. It was always pleasant to be around him. He was the type of person, just like his son, that everyone got along with. But now back to the story. As I'd said before, my roommate and I had headed out for a bike ride and the movies. We took a long trail along a major road in West Palm. That day being a national holiday, traffic wasn't bad, and I was using a single speed bike, and I could not keep up with my roommate's 19 speed bike. I stopped, sent him a text, and turned around. We agreed to meet where the truck was parked. I used the same road and stopped at a local Walgreens to buy something to drink. Remember, this is the middle of summer in Florida, and it can be very hot during the day. I continued on my bicycle ride, and when I was nearing a certain spot by a business plaza, a certain feeling fell upon me. It is not easy to explain, it was like a voice, but not in the sense of when you verbalize words to a person. Instead, it was like a voice that seemed to have originated from within me. The voice told me to turn left. Next thing I know, I find myself turning left without even thinking about it. As I reached the parking lot on the plaza, I saw a female gathering shopping carts for the Whole Foods located at the plaza. I smiled and waved at her, and she smiled in return. Then her eyes got real big. Two seconds later, we heard the most horrible noise of tires squealing and then a loud bang. The sound of twisted metal, and I turned around, and to my surprise, there was a car crash. A four-door Toyota Corolla that was totaled and an SUV in a really bad shape. For reasons I do not comprehend, they had crashed head on. What struck me the most was that they had crashed at the very same spot I was about to cross with my bicycle. Needless to say, I would have been crushed between the two vehicles, and I would not have made it out alive. Now, going back to the subject of the old man. The next day, Friday the 5th of July, I returned to work. My boss looked pale and depressed. He seemed distant. Before I even say good morning, he tells me his father had passed away the day before. I ask him what time the old man died, and that's when things got strange. The old man had died a few minutes before I was about to cross that intersection. Coincidence? Maybe. Divine intervention? Well, I'd like to think so. After all, I wouldn't be alive if it not for that voice that warned me about the upcoming danger. 
This experience taught me to always listen to that sixth sense gut feeling, butterflies in your stomach, whatever you want to call it. This feeling is always right, and thus you should listen to it. One day, maybe it will even save your life. This man was a good person. Perhaps he was fond of me too, and decided that I was too young to perish. I live in Eastern Europe, more exactly in Romania. You may have heard about those gypsy witches that live in my country. Most of them are just pretending to be something they're not. This, however, is the story of a real witch. My grandmother used to live in the same village with a witch. I don't know if the witch was a gypsy or Romanian, but it doesn't really matter. She lived for so many years that no one knew her age. This woman claimed to be a witch, and she had also claimed that she had this demon who served her. She used to talk about the way she sold her soul one night in the forest while performing a ritual. In return, she gained powers and the help of a demon. She said that she couldn't die until she convinced someone to take full charge and responsibility of her duty as a witch and sell his or her soul to the darkness as well. She, I believe, had three daughters, but people said that their mother's behavior scared them away. They moved to Bucharest and never returned to the village. Now, you will say that she was most likely a crazy old woman, but no. A lot of people heard weird noises coming from her attic, and she agreed that the sounds were made by her slave demon. People, even though afraid, asked her to solve their problems and gave her money for doing so. No one ever complained about her work. No one. Everything was put in place no matter how difficult the task was. People witnessed a lot of hard work getting done overnight in her yard and garden, things that she wasn't able to do alone. My grandmother met a woman on her way to work. The woman asked my grandmother about the witch. She wanted to know where the witch lived. My grandma gave indications and then asked her why she was going to go see her. She said that a thief broke into her house and stole her savings, and she wanted her money back. The next day, my grandmother met the woman again. She carried a bag, and my grandma asked her what happened. She said that she went to the witch and received the promise that she would be able to find the money on the table when she returned home. The witch asked in advance for half the money. The woman agreed. It was better than nothing and things happened exactly as the witch foretold. And she carried the promised money in the bag on the way to the witch's house. Another story is that a woman fell in love with a married man. She went to the witch and told her that she wanted that man. The witch asked her if she wanted the man no matter what the consequences were. She said yes, and in less than a month, his wife got ill and passed. He remarried, and he got married to the woman who asked for his wife to fall. That's why she was seen as a powerful and real witch. For sure, she had some supernatural powers. Unfortunately, I don't know if she's still alive. I am the youngest of two daughters. My sister Isabel, being a year older than me, and we are polar opposites, physically, mentally, and emotionally. Isabel is a buxom version of my father, her body having developed quite early. Both of them are control freaks, who think that their word is law, and they should get away with whatever they want, with no one having any right to refuse but they can never make a stand against my mother, who is a mostly reasonable and calm, nurturing person. The thing is, when she loses her temper, no one wants to cross her, because she is a tsunami. There is no one who gets in her way. I am just like her. During her youth and when she reached adulthood, 
with an underdeveloped body that caused many to always mistake us for being younger than we were. I also have her somewhat aloof attitude with strangers. But I'm super sweet with people I care about. I also have a habit of ignoring those who try to get on my nerves. But with my mother's temper, which both my father and sister disapprove of, since I made it clear that I won't let anyone control me. Although I do respect my parents very much. This first story takes place when I was about 12 years old. I'm 34 now. But the memory of that time is still one of the most vivid and frightful memories I have. And whenever I try to talk about it with my sister, she freaks out, because she doesn't want to remember. I don't know if these two incidences in the story I'm about to tell you are related or not. We used to live in a flat situated on the ground floor of the building that we moved into and often felt like we weren't the only ones residing there. Many times out of the corner of our eyes, we would see someone peeking at us from around the corner of wherever we were. But whenever we looked, there was no one there. Although we had neighbors also living on the ground floor, and two stories above us, we were mostly the types to keep to ourselves, mainly because our parents were quite protective of us. Partly because my older was constantly being reported by neighbors and schoolmates flirting with a guy who caught her fancy, even though she was only 13. We had chosen that particular flat on the ground floor due to the fact that my mother Rosaline suffered an accident when I was seven where she broke her hip and had to have it replaced with a metal joint. She walked with a limp and had to support herself with a cane whenever she moved about. This first incident occurred one night during a weekend, Saturday, a few months before my mother was diagnosed with leukemia. None of us had turned in yet. So we were all still awake, although we were getting ready for bed since it was already 10pm. Our German Shepherd puppy bonkers was in the bedroom that I shared with my parents and my older sister, resting his chin on my mother's lap and dozing as she scratched the area behind his ear as she read the true life story section of Reader's Digest. My father, Edgar, was reading the newest edition of Car and Driver, while my sister Isabel was reading a teenage romance. I, however, had been reading The Hound of the Burskervilles. I went to the toilet to answer a call of nature. And after I finished with my business, washed my hands and exited the bathroom, turning off the light as I did so. After I turned off the bathroom light, I noticed that the beaded curtain hanging in the doorway at the end of the corridor that led to the dining room and living room was moving as if someone had just passed through. We never turned off the lights in those parts of the house since the living room had only one window but the dining room had none. So everything would be close to pitch black, even in broad daylight, if we did not keep the lights on. I thought it was Isabel probably going to get a drink before bed, since she always had the habit of doing that. So naturally I followed to see what she was going to swipe from the fridge. The fridge was in the dining room since the kitchen was quite small and didn't have enough space to accommodate it comfortably. When I reached the dining room, I was surprised to see that there was no one there. When suddenly, I felt an unexplainable chill go through my body, followed by a feeling of terror that made me shake all over. I turned and raced back down the corridor to the bedroom, realizing that something was behind me, chasing me trying to get its nightmarish hands on me. I could almost feel its breath on my neck and an unspoken command to turn and see what it was. But thankfully, I was too scared out of my head to heed those words. And upon reaching the bedroom door, I wrenched it open, barreling inside, ignoring my father's booming roar of a God damn it, Eleanor. 
what the hell are you doing this time of night? I looked at him long enough to see the fury on my father's face and that Isabel, my mother, was there with him. The two looked surprised before Bonkers sprang to his feet, alert. His ears were perking up before he started growling as I slammed the bedroom door shut and locked it. Suddenly, something slammed against the door, the impact shaking the wood violently. Bonkers began barking at the top of his lungs, his eyes on the door as I turned and ran into my mother's arms, terrified beyond words. What the hell? No sooner had Isabel spoken when a demonic growl sounded outside the door, followed by scratching. I think I fainted at that point, because when I opened my eyes, it was 6am and the sun was rising. My mother was lying beside me, still awake, with both her arms around me like she didn't want to let me go. Ever. Bonkers was on my stomach, his tiny paws on my still flat chest, as if trying to protect my heartbeat. My father and Isabel must have dozed off sometime during the night. The former propped up near the footboard of the king-size bed that my parents shared, the latter on my father's side of the bed behind my mother. How are you feeling, baby? My mother asked, gently brushing the hair from my face. When I turned to face and hug her, after scratching bonkers behind the ear, the terror from the previous night came back to me, and I started to cry. My mother held me, the way she always did. It took a long time for me to calm down, but when I finally did, I managed to tell everyone present, bonkers included, what exactly had happened the previous night. I will never forget the look on their faces when I was done, but needless to say, the end results were that Mama's friends were called to cleanse the house and burn sage. A priest was also asked to do a blessing, although none of them stopped the nightmares that plagued me after it. If only it worked. Three months later, we were told that my mother had leukemia, and my world fell apart. It was also around the time that the second incident occurred, just after I had forgotten about the night terror I'd experienced. It was summer vacation, so we were allowed to sleep in. My parents left for my mother's checkup one morning around 8am, and I was asleep on their bed, which is right next to the double deck my sister and I use. My sister was sleeping on the upper bunk, and barely 15 minutes after my parents left, I heard someone saying, psst, from the foot of my parents' bed. I thought it was my older sister, so I didn't pay it any attention and tried to go back to sleep. Suddenly, I felt something change, and then an ominous demonic growl sounded from the foot of the bed. I don't remember ever moving so fast in my preteen years. I threw the covers and scrambled onto the upper bunk where I found my older sister still sleeping, but my arrival jolted her awake. Before she could snap at me for waking her so suddenly, we heard the growling again. Only this time it came from the spot on my parents' bed that I had just vacated. And we felt like something was glaring at us, even though it was broad daylight and there wasn't anyone else in the room but us. My sister and I huddled together under her blanket, and I could feel that whatever was there was watching us as we lay there the whole time. Since the bedroom door was on the other side of the room, there was no way that we could get out. When our parents came back from the hospital, they found us shaking, and we couldn't even speak. When we finally could talk, we told them what happened. It was obvious they believed us, and didn't leave us for the rest of the day. I remember clinging tightly to my mother for that whole week. And when my older sister and I managed to talk about what happened, she told me one of the things that had freaked her out about the encounter was how white my face was and how scared I'd looked, since I was always the braver one of the two. She said that the last time she had seen me look so scared was on the night that I had been chased into the bedroom 
I what she suspected was a demonic spirit. My mother succumbed to the leukemia that tore at her body during Christmas of that year. And in losing her, I lost the one person who had ever truly loved me. For the next story I wish to share with you, it's important to note that I am from the Philippines. I've had several paranormal experiences since I was a child, including the ones from earlier, although they are most limited to seeing figures out of the corner of my eye that aren't there when I look, or the feeling of another presence with me, and knowing that I am not alone. Although there is an encounter where I saw a figure as clear as day in the wee hours of the morning that still haunts me. I was 16 years old this time, and spending the weekend with two of my cousins from my late mother's side, since my father was going to be working to fill in a co-worker who had taken a few days off due to his wife giving birth to a new child. I arrived at my aunt's house on a cloudy Friday evening, that promised a heavy night of rain with some overnight clothes and my cousins, Erin and Will, aged 11 and eight respectively. We were happy to see them. And after dinner, I helped the housekeeper with the dishes while my aunt gave the kids their pre bedtime baths. And soon we were all settled in for the night. I was given the guest room overlooking the backyard that had a huge tree that bears a fruit that we call Chico here in the Philippines. After a quick Google Translate, I learnt that it's called Sapota, or may be known as mud apple or nooseberry. In any case, said tree overlooks the mini swimming pool that is directly below my window. Erin came to my room with her pillow asking if she could sleep next to me. I was more than happy to oblige, since she was my favorite amongst all the cousins on my mother's side. Her little brother Will followed a few minutes later, asking if he could sleep in my room also. But I could sense that Erin had come into my room to get away from Will, since he was her parents preferred child, and she often felt left out. Even without saying it, I knew Erin also asked to sleep in my room, since I was one of the few people who wasn't that fond of her brother, and I always preferred her company over his. I explained to Will that if he and Erin slept in my room, his mother would be alone, and that it would be really sad. He bought onto my reasoning and bid us all good night. Erin fell asleep beside me almost instantly while holding my hand. And after a few minutes of listening to her breathing, I too fell asleep, just as the rain started to fall with the comforting pisser patter outside the window. Some of the branches of the tree outside the window were long and thick, and I could clearly see a figure that looked like an eight year old boy standing with one of his hands resting on the trunk, as if for balance. The funny thing is that the figure was completely black. I couldn't see any of its facial features. The only distinguishable detail I could make out aside from what I described earlier, was the figure's short but somewhat unruly hair. Although I could see the figure's face, I could feel its eyes on me the entire time. I don't know why but I wasn't scared and my mind was completely blank, probably because I was still sleepy, even though I knew that what I was looking at was real. After returning the figure's gaze for a full minute, I gave it a casual wave to say goodnight and lay back down besides Erin. I fell asleep as soon as I closed my eyes. When I next opened them, I found that it was 7.30 in the morning and everyone else was only just starting to stir. Remember the figure from 3am? I sat up slowly careful not to wake Karen and looked at the tree that was now bathed in sunlight. The figure was now gone. I didn't speak about the 3am encounter since I knew that Erin specifically was terrified of ghosts. However, 
I told my father when he picked me up Sunday afternoon. He didn't say anything, but I could tell that it troubled him so. He told me to draw the curtains next time I was asked to sleep over, and I always closed the curtains at home. But since Erin had asked to leave them open when I slept there, I had obliged. What did you think the figure was? I know of these little dwarves slash elves in Filipino folklore, along with some malevolent entities that my older sister and I simply refer to as plant people, since they can appear as plants or shapeshift into someone you know, only to snatch you away if you're close enough for them to grab you. When I was between the ages of seven and 10, I lived in a house in a small town in Missouri. Nothing was abnormal about the house. I mean, normal house settling noises, which would cause me to have nightmares frequently until this incident that I will begin diving into. The only weird thing that ever happened was our keys going missing. When you walk in the door, there was a giant metal wood stove that we put our keys on. They went missing for weeks. We destroyed the house looking for them, and one day they just reappeared and nobody knew where they came from. Anyway, there was a doll back when I was younger called an Amazing Grace doll. She had holes in her ears so she could hear you and would turn her head where the noise came from and would say, Mama. Well, I loved this doll. I explicitly remember cleaning my room and propping Grace against the wall so she was sitting up. I lay down on my bed to read when I heard the clicking she would make when her head turned. So I looked up and stared at her and got the normal mama she would say after she heard something. So I tossed my book down and picked her up to make sure she was turned off. She was. I flipped her switch and then flipped it back to off thinking that it was a normal malfunction. I set her back in a spot and plopped down to continue reading. When I started, she said mama again. So I went and took all her batteries out. I was over it at this point. So I just tossed her on the ground and went back to my spot. She started clicking quicker and her head was moving back and forth. And she just kept repeating mama. I took off. I ran to get my dad and he saw it and decided that we would burn the little doll. We did and nothing happened again to my recollection, but my nightmares got worse. And this was when I was still religious, so I would put all my stuffed animals around me in a circle to protect me. I had a turquoise dream catcher and would pray every night for the nightmare to go away. They didn't until we moved. They weren't every day, but definitely several times a week. I've heard a lot of ghost stories growing up. I'm Italian and my mother's family is from the South, known to be far more superstitious than people are here in the North. Ghosts, haunted houses, desecrated churches, gnomes, elves living underground. Hearing all this kind of thing is commonplace in my family. And it can be a great source of fun during holiday gatherings, especially if you're a little bit drunk. This story, however, is different in a way that spooks me to no end. My grandparents were both born a few years after the end of World War II, and they were both really young when they moved to Milan with their parents to study and work. There they met, had a kid and married at the age of 18, living in such a vibrant environment like the city of Milan was during the 60s and 70s made them develop pretty liberal ideas. They joined the Italian Communist Party. My great great grandfather had been in the resistance, joined workers marches and unions. They were and still are both atheists. My grandma took part in women's union and the feminism movement. They are not the first two people I think of when we are talking about superstition and close encounters with the paranormal. And yet, when they were in their late 20s, they went on holiday to Tuscany to a small farmhouse. Everything was perfect as you'd expect in a Tuscany holiday spot to be until it wasn't. During the night, they woke up in their rooms to the sound of steps and low chanting. They waited in the dark, surprised and terrified. 
as the door of their bedroom opened and a procession started to walk in. They looked like friars, clad in dark tunics with their hoods covering their faces, singing in Latin and carrying what looked like a coffin on their shoulders. They circled the bed, stood in front of my shaking grandparents until the song ended, and they left in the same way they'd come in. My grandparents waited until the spot was clear. They gathered their stuff and ran away at the speed of light, turning their car around in the direction of home, never to return again. To this day, I still haven't decided if they're playing an elaborate prank on all of us. If they took some sort of drug that night, and now they're too shameful to admit it. I think LSD was pretty common back then. Or if they were the ones getting pranked by a group of hilarious people who took it way too far. It's still insane to think about, and I can't help but feel uncomfortable at the genuine fear I think I can see in my very rational grandma's eyes when she tells the story, and my granddad's complete avoidance on this subject. I lived in the RGV, living in Edinburgh, but grew up in Rio Grande City my entire life. My grandma told me stories of her encounters with the Lechuza when I was a kid. I was usually skeptical of mystical tales, but when it came to my grandmother, I bought her stories. It wasn't until I had my own experience that I was fully invested in other old wives' tales and folklore. I was out at a friend's ranch north of Rio Grande City with my buddy and a cousin of mine, a mutual friend and my buddy's dad. We were putting up some fence posts and barbed wire so we can corral some stray cattle that had wandered onto the property and keep them there until we found the owner. The sun was setting, so we decided to call it a day. We built a bonfire close by and huddled up in an unfinished ranch hand's house basically a concrete slab surrounded by four walls and no roof. We were drinking and just shooting the breeze and telling stories from high school, when eventually, we got to stories of the paranormal. My buddy is a huge skeptic, mostly because he's afraid of it. So he kept trying to steer the conversation away from ghosts and such. I decided to share a lechuza story my grandmother told me. Once I got to describing the creature, we heard an ungodly screech, almost ear-piercing. We all turned to look in the direction of the screech, and before my eyes can adjust to the darkness, I hear my buddy screaming that it's a lechuza, and he hauls ass to the main ranch house a few hundred yards away. I turn back to the darkness, and see a giant silhouette of an owl perched on one of the posts we had driven earlier in the day. It was massive. So naturally, I did one of the two things they tell you never to do. I whistled at it. This thing screeched again and spread out its wings. Its wingspan had to be in at least seven feet in each direction, so 14 feet. The fence posts were spaced about 16 feet apart and its wings almost spanned half the distance. Scared out of my mind, I pumped my chubby tree trunk thighs as hard as I could and ran. As I had the back door to the ranch house in view, I got to see my buddy run in and close the door behind him. My cousin and our friend got their moments later too, and I hadn't noticed they took off right after my buddy, and were kicking and pounding on the door nearly in tears. I get about halfway there and look back to the unfinished house and see the gigantic bird perched up on one of the walls, its face catching the moonlight as it cocks its head sideways, kind of how a dog does when they hear the owner make a strange sound. In the mere moment of its face being lit up, I swear I was able to make out human-like features with a bonfire lighting up the area behind it. I finally reach the ranch house and my buddy's dad opens the door and we're almost to tears. I rush in, close the door behind me, and my buddy's dad demands to know what's going on. Trying to catch my breath, I tell him with the others adding their points of view as well. We all look out the back door to see if it's still there, and just try to convince ourselves that we saw a regular owl, and my buddy's dad called us some rude names between chuckles. We scanned the horizon, 
and I'm armed with a baseball bat I found at the back door. My buddy with his firearm, and there's no bird. We got back with flashlights, me, my bat, my cousin, and a few weapons. We got back with our equipment, and our friend stayed back at the ranch house. He was done for the night. We get back to the bonfire to snuff it out. Smokey the bear was always kind of an influence on me, and we investigate the surrounding area. My buddy's dad breaks off from the group to check out the fence post to make sure they're undisturbed while we just hang back to think what happened. After a bit, we go join my buddy's dad and find him standing in front of the post we had originally seen the lechos are perched on. We never told him which one specifically, so I was kind of surprised to see him at the one. And then we saw the claw marks. I am a collector of vintage and antique items, including mid-century fashion dolls. I usually purchase them from thrift stores, estate sales, or very occasionally on Craigslist. Recently, I purchased a group of 1960s Barbie dolls that were a real bargain. I know the woman had a great knowledge of vintage dolls since she used to sell them on eBay, so she knew what they were worth. Still, I didn't question why she was selling them at such a low price. I was delighted with said purchase and couldn't wait to fix them up for my collection. A few days later, my bedroom suddenly became infested with flies. It was absolutely insane how many of these dirty little beasts filled my room. They seemed bent on driving me mad as they were constantly buzzing in my face or landing on or over me. Some folks say that flies are a bad omen that signify the coming of bad times. These flies were of plague-like proportions, and were also a true enigma of why they arrived when they did. Around the time, I became very ill with flu-like symptoms. The weirdest part of this illness was a strange feeling like my brain was burning. I also experienced severe headaches that included crazy brain fog that felt like torture. It's hard to articulate exactly what the feeling was, but I've never experienced such an odd feeling in my head. It was so intense that ending my life crossed my mind. One last oddity to add to the pile. Usually I'm a very vivid dreamer with dreams that always have the same basic elements. After the purchase, my dreams have become dark and muddled. When I wake up, I feel exhausted as if I haven't slept. So why did I equate these mysterious happenings with the recent purchase of the dolls? I know it's not entirely logical, but it's just a strong feeling I have. What should I do? Could an inanimate object be cursed or bring bad luck? Maybe that's why she sold them for so cheap. I just want to add that I do not practice the occult nor believe in ghosts. The reason being is that after my father passed away quite recently, I saw no sign of him. My best friend also ended his own life some years before that. And I felt that if I were ever to experience a spiritual visit, he would have given me some sign. I just want to believe, but I can't. When I was nine, my sister was the victim of a hit and run. This happened right up the road from where we lived, two houses up to be exact. About a year after her passing, I was walking across the street two houses up when I heard my name yelled very loudly. I stopped and looked behind me. No one was there. When I turned around, there was a car in front of me. It was passing me, and the woman driving clearly didn't see me. She was looking at the radio. She drove past me and I finished crossing the street. There is no doubt in my mind that if I hadn't stopped, I would have been hit by her car. I looked and never saw anyone outside or at the window. I never figured out who it was who yelled my name. Could it have been an echo of my sister? This happened to my uncle's wife. I will narrate it how she did to me and my sisters. We're from the northern state of Mexico, Nuevo Leon, from a small town south of Monterrey around El Cierro de la Silla. If you've never heard of it, do Google it, it's beautiful. 
Stories about people seeing witches and lechuzas around the town are very common, but my aunt's story really pulls a chill down my spine. The story goes like this. I lived in a small home up in the hills. I shared a room with my sister, our windows facing the main street. It was big and it had rails on the window. One night, me and my sister were in bed. She was asleep and I was awake, lying on my bed, looking outside my window, since my bed was against the wall and right underneath the window. I liked opening the window and looking up at the sky. I remembered being around 3 a.m. when I decided that I had to get some rest. I stood up just to close my window and that's when I saw her, the witch, flying right in front of my house. She saw me and we made eye contact and I immediately shut my window and got under my covers and started praying. I eventually fell asleep and awoke to the fresh air hitting my face as I opened my eyes and I see my head sticking out the window. I scream as loud as I could and my sister woke up to help me. I'd never been afraid like I had been at that moment in all my life, as I realized that it was only her power that caused me to look out my window like that. If it wasn't for the rails, she would have had me. My aunt told us that her grandma would tell that the witches would take kids out their windows at night, and she never believed her until it happened to her. She believed the witch wanted revenge because my aunt made eye contact with her. The crazy part is that until this day, she sometimes wakes up with random bruises or hickey marks on her skin. Well, that's her story. I grew up in a haunted house. It was a pretty old house. It still had horsehair insulation, that velvet damask wallpaper, dirt floor basement, crystal doorknobs, cubby holes that you would crawl from one room to another, and a really nice clawfoot tub, along with an awesome wood stove. It was big enough that it had a front and back staircase. The front staircase was really ornate, but the back staircase was basically just plywood. Okay, now that you have a visual, on with my family's experiences. When I was very young, I became more aware of the noises and actions, and my parents would tell me it was all in my head. The older I got, the more I began to doubt that. Starting with the everyday and night experiences, like the footsteps up and down every night, mostly heard on the creaky back staircase low knocks on the walls, taps on the windows, items moved or crashed on the floor. And the scariest was gentle scratching noises under my bed and feeling someone sit on my bed. I began wrapping my blankets over my head and blocking my ears with my fingers. Around 10, it became more intense. Doors opening and closing with enough force that it was definitely not a draft. The silverware drawer was completely pulled out and smashed to the floor when everyone was in the living room, feeling not so much a tug on my hair, but like someone was lifting up strands. At this point, my little brother of six and me at 10 had been sharing a bedroom. All the rooms were huge. My dad built me my very own room that was previously attic space, but on the same floor. It was huge and was more like a living room with a bedroom around the corner. Every few days, I would be in bed and hear my door creak open. Someone walk over to my bed and sit down. It was terrifying. I still used to go blankets over my head and fingers in my ears. The knocking on the walls started to become more louder and fast. The scratching under my bed seemed to be a bit more violent. My parents still dismissed our fears. When I was around 11 or 12, it became even more intense. I had to babysit my little brother almost every day during the week. This was back in the day 
when TVs had knobs to change the channel. We would be in the living room watching TV, and the knobs would visually turn by themselves. Sometimes only a few channels over, and other times fast through a bunch. Like my parents, I downplayed it to my little brother, and just took him outside to play pickle or kick the can with the neighborhood kids. They had already told me the rumors about the house, and would hardly ever come over. The most notable experience was walking down the back stairs. A strand of my hair was tugged hard, and I heard distinct breathing in my ear. I grabbed my brother, and went across the street and waited in the pouring rain for my parents to get home. Ironically, where we waited was an entrance to an old cemetery but I don't believe it was related to the haunting. The older I got, the more aggressive it got. TV knobs still being turned, curtains moving, steps up the stairs turning into stomps. The weirdest to me was the phone cord. It was one of those extremely long cords. The whole family was in the kitchen and it started spinning. Not like a regular spin, but diagonally, like a lasso, about five feet off the wall. My parents downplayed that too. But by then, it didn't matter. I started to become desensitized. Going into fifth grade, I acquired a new best friend. She would come over, and it turns out we were both really into the supernatural. Watcher in the woods with Betty Davis was our favorite movie. I ended up telling her about the house, and we came up with a brilliant plan to buy one of those Hasbro Ouija boards, candles lit and everything. Never even thinking it would work, and I don't remember if I actually did get it to work, but one day while babysitting, I had my innocent little brother play with me. The board immediately worked. My brother was freaking out, but I kept on going. I don't exactly remember the exact questions, but some of the answers were, kill John, my little brother. My addiction with all things horror, movies and books and such, led me to believe I had to burn the board. I took it out to the side yard and tried to burn it, but it just scorched a little bit. My father asked why there was a huge pile of burnt leaves and sticks, and I told him why and he got really serious. He dug the board out of the sticks and leaves and tried to burn it himself on the wood stove. It still just scorched, but more charcoal-like. So he threw it in the trash. After that, things didn't get much worse, but different. I had a huge double closet filled with metal hangers. The sound of them clanking against each other like a hand sweeping over them became a new scare. I reverted to my usual finger in ears and blanket overhead technique. But then I started getting pissed. I was so sick of being scared. I started yelling at whatever it was to leave us alone whenever it happened and yelled that I wasn't afraid anymore, telling it to piss off. I had a game most people won't remember called Boggle. It was a cube of letters and you shook it up and tried to find as many words as possible. One day, I sat it in my living room and arranged the letters to say, go away before bed. I woke up to the words being scrambled to say, hump, gross I know. Everything ramped up, louder knocks, heavier sitting on my bed and more frequent visits into my room. By then I didn't care I knew it sounds weird, but I started calling it out before I went to bed, and to wake me up at certain times, and it actually did with more gentle knocks by my bed. When something visual happened, I would tell it to cut it out. It didn't really listen that much, but it did occasionally. At the end of that experience, by the time I started fighting back, we moved. A few years later, my parents admitted it was haunted and described some of their experiences too. I'm still drawn to that house, and I'm dying to walk through it again to see if it remembers me. Weird, I know. I've researched the house and owners and events related to it. 
The rumor was there was an older woman that died there and had an Irish wake. It was held in the house and lasted a week. I've desperately searched for the previous owners names, but found nothing. One notable thing is that the house has changed hands quite a few times since then. A few months ago, I brought it up to my mum, and she told me the previous owners were a woman and her son that was a well known judge. Their last name was Moriarty. Also, she told me how the day after the house was sold, the woman's daughter ripped the kitchen phone off the wall and screamed at my mother. But now we couldn't use it to make long distance calls. It didn't take long to find info on the son. He was a really well known judge. The most messed up thing I learned from his obituary. He took a sabbatical to travel the world to visit sites that people have claimed to have seen the Virgin Mary. Why that is important out of everything that happened. See the image of the classic depiction of the Virgin Mary in my little brother's bedroom window was the most predominant memory. I wasn't scared, but more curious and then it faded. What are the chances? I'm also agnostic, but for some reason have always felt a deep representation when I need someone to guide me. So I recite Hail Mary. It's been quite therapeutic sharing this. There are many more silly stories about what happened when I was young. But at the present time, I've been seeing moving shadows out of the corner of my eyes every once in a while, as well as orbs. Perhaps one day, I'll be able to revisit my old place and see if the spooks are still about. The first time I had a supernatural experience, I was about five years old. My mother used to fly sailplanes earlier in her youth and still had a lot of friends in the airfield and would often take me with her for a bit of hanging around, grilling or flying on small planes owned by her friends. It was always a lot of fun. Bordering the airfields were woods where a lot of people associated with the place had small summer cabins for staying over. This one weekend, my mum and I were going to stay at her friend's cabin. It was already dark when we got there. And I remember first walking into it and looking around. There was a large dining table with chairs and just to the left of the entrance, a beautifully carved wooden chest. The head of the table was about two meters away from the chest. And that's where I sat while my mum and the other lady went into the adjacent kitchen to cook up something to eat. The door to the kitchen was at the other end of the table right in front of me. So the little me was sitting on the chair dangling my legs as I couldn't reach the floor drawing when I felt something hug me from behind. I knew it wasn't my mum as I had just seen her go into the kitchen. I didn't get too long to contemplate as the grip tightened and I got swung backwards along with the chair. I was sitting on it and was dragged backwards towards the chest. The chair slammed into it with such force that I almost fell over. Naturally, I started screaming. Both women ran to me. My mum lost trying to calm me. My mum's friend looked a little shaken, but said that they were bogeymen living in the chest and that they have always been strange things happening, but she had never seen anything this severe. We did stay the night, but nothing else happened. But this has been etched into my memory. I recently asked my mum about it and she confirmed that it wasn't just my mind playing tricks on me. The second time I was a little older, my mum and I had moved out of my grandparents and into our own apartment, but I would still visit my grandparents every weekend and stay over. I think I must have been about seven at the time. It was around nine in the evening and my grandma was putting me to bed. The bed was positioned in such a way that my feet were facing the door and I could see the corridor. As it was still a bit early for my grandparents, they closed my door. So the hallway light 
would not bother me. I rolled onto my side, thinking that I wasn't tired at all, looking for my Tetris game I had near the bed. When I saw the bright light at the door, figuring it was my grandma checking in to see if I wasn't about to do exactly what I was planning to do, I turned back to the door and it was closed. The light was coming from above it. As my eyes adjusted to the brightness, I could make out stairs in the beam of light and then bare feet descending. I quickly decided that I did not want to see whatever it was that was coming down the steps and did what any kid would do, hid under the covers. When I finally got the courage to look out again, it was dark. The third experience happened years later. By this time, I had rekindled the relationship with my father and would visit him during the weekends and holidays. He lived on the opposite side of the same city, a little on the outskirts, and I would have to take two buses to get there. It was autumn and darkness came earlier this season. The second bus I was taking would start its route in the city center, pass a shady neighborhood, then go through some fields up a long hill and finally get to the suburb in which he lived. As it was a Friday evening, the bus was quite full and I was standing next to the door looking out. I couldn't see that much with the bus being lit and there being twilight outside. I leaned my face against the glass so I could see better. At this time, the bus had just started climbing the hill I mentioned earlier. There was nothing but open weedy fields and a few scattered trees out there. And I could see a man running across the fields. My first thought was that he was out jogging. But why was he jogging in the field? The weeds were waist high, definitely not a pleasant evening run. The man was dressed in all white, which made it easy for me to follow him. As I was watching him, I started to get an eerie feeling, but I couldn't put my finger on it. So I kept at it. And then it sort of hit me. The road up with the hill was a long straight one where no one kept to the speed limit and the bus was going at at least 60. But I had been watching this man run through waist long grass parallel to the bus for a few minutes now and he wasn't in any way lagging behind. As soon as that realization got to me, the man turned slightly and stepped towards the road. My eyes were glued. As I remembered the last time something like this happened, I hid under the covers and almost missed it. So I was determined. The man got closer and closer, bigger and bigger, and then slammed against the glass of the door right in my face. I felt the impact and recoiled. And then the man just disappeared. I looked around at the other passengers. Surely someone must have seen it, surely. There was another person standing right next to me, looking out the same door window. Nothing. None of them saw a thing. When the bus finally reached my stop, there was still a bit of walking through a wooded area to get to my father's house. I don't think I've ever ran so fast in all my life before or since. The creepy part came on Sunday when I was going home, this time in daylight. I wasn't going to go through there at night. I was looking onto the other side of the road, trying to find some clues as to what happened. And right at the spot where I had seen the ghostly man hit the bus was a pile of dead brown flowers and burnt out candles. The kind people put at the sites of accidents when someone passes away. My brother used to live with our aunt for a few years. My youngest cousin, who was a little girl back then, was made to share a room with her older sister, so my brother could use her room. My little cousin's room was filled with dolls of all shapes and sizes, as in the only space in the room without one was the bed and a few steps leading to it. As expected, this creeped up my brother all the time, and he would take his time to reposition them in a way that their backs faced him instead. 
but without fail every time he woke up, all the dolls were facing him again. He said there were even three or four dolls that always, always ended up sitting beside his head, even if he had put them away in the cabinet or locked them out of the room. At first we tried brushing it off by saying it couldn't have been our cousins playing a prank on him until it went on even when he was alone in the house for days. He got so used to it, it didn't bother him anymore after a few months, as it happened to him until the day he moved out two years later. My aunt and cousin said they'd never experienced anything remotely weird in that room, so it was clear they had a preference for my brother. I am a woman in my 60s. I come from country redneck farm stock. While I have a good imagination, and I'm very creative, I live firmly grounded in reality with a non-denominational Christian belief system. I grew up knowing spirits were real, both evil and good. I technically don't believe in ghosts as the shades of dead people floating around doing things because my belief system says that when you die, you go to one of two places, heaven or hell. I live in a very small neighborhood in Alaska. It's a cul-de-sac with only five houses on it. My husband and I have lived here for several decades. At the time, my scary experiences happened and we were well acquainted with all the neighbors. Times have changed since then and now we are only passing acquaintances with most of them. It's a quiet neighborhood where everyone respects everyone else's privacy, but will step in to help anytime it's needed. As some of you might know, in the summer, Alaska has a great deal of sunlight. At midnight in the summer, it's still light enough out to read a book outside and easily identify things even from a distance. It's like twilight in the lower 48. So many unexplainable things have happened in this neighborhood that I can only choose three of the most vivid to tell you. All three episodes remain unexplained to this day. The first one occurred during a summer night. It was almost midnight and I was standing in my backyard having a final cigarette, accompanied by one of my dogs, an elderly, very gentle golden retriever mix. A movement at my neighbor's house caught my eye and then my little girl growled. That was unusual for her. I looked at my neighbor's house and saw a person wearing blue jeans and a yellow jacket crouching by her car, apparently peering in with their hands cupped to the glass. I stepped forward to ask her what she was doing, worried that perhaps she'd lock herself out. And although I had extra keys to everyone's house, she didn't want to wake me up that late. As I moved forward, the figure straightened up and moved towards the rear of the car. It didn't walk, it flowed. Without the up and down motion of walking, as if it reached the rear of the car, it exploded into a yellow mist and vanished. I stood there stunned. My cigarette burnt down unnoticed while I stared and squinted. I tried to make sense of what had happened. My little dog was pressed against my legs shivering. Since it was so late, I didn't want to disturb the neighbor. So I went back inside to bed. The next day, I waited until she got home from work but thought better of saying anything just yet. I needed to try and debunk or explain what had happened. That night, I went out at the same time of night with the same dog, stood in the same spot and lit a cigarette. Nothing happened. Her car stood serenely in place in the last rays of sun setting on it. No figures moved, no bushes were in the way. There was nothing that I could see that explained what happened. The dog was unmarried. I eventually told her what had happened and she wasn't surprised at all. Rather, a bit relieved that someone else had finally seen something. The second episode happened in the winter where the lighting is the opposite. It's dark most of the day. My pickup truck was parked in our driveway. I had brought several bags of dog food earlier that day. That summer, I had fallen over a dog and broken a finger on each hand 
and had just recently had another several surgeries. I went to feed the dogs and realized I had forgotten to bring a bag of dog food in. Being an independent sort, I didn't ask my husband to get the food, but shoved on a coat and some boots and went out of the truck. I'm only five feet tall, so getting something out the back of a four wheeler drive truck isn't exactly easy. I switched on the outside light, walk past our Mustang that was parked in the car spot. I struggled with the tailgate of my truck one handed and poured the bag of dog food out the back to the ground. As I reached back to close the tailgate, I looked up to see a man wearing jeans and a t shirt standing beside the Mustang watching me. Of course, I assumed it was my husband who had come out to help. And when I got the tailgate shut, I looked back to make a sarcastic comment about his timing. No one was there. The light was still on, the driveway, carport and my truck were brightly illuminated. I still thought maybe he'd just gone inside because, you know, winter, and he didn't have any outdoor gear on. I managed to haul the bag to my shoulder and trudge into the house. To my surprise, he was sitting on the couch watching hockey wearing a tank top and shorts, not being outside watching me get dog food wearing jeans and a shirt. The third thing happened during the summer, but it was the daytime. It was hot, and I was in my yard lounging in the shade wearing shorts barefoot. All at once, I heard what sounded like a very close gunshot. It echoed off the mountains. I went out through the back gate without stopping to put on shoes as one of my neighbors emerged from her house. We conferred and decided where we thought the shot had come from and began walking in that direction. We noticed another neighbor standing in his backyard, looking in that same direction, so we all went over to speak to him. We were all lightly clad because of summer. To Alaskans, 60 degrees is a heat wave. I was still barefoot. We joined him in his yard and conferred further upon the matter to see perhaps if we needed to offer help to the yet unknown victim. However, there was no further commotion and we decided it must have been a firecracker or a backfire. And we all three turned at the same time to walk back to the front of the house. Because I was barefoot, I paused for a second to look down to make sure I wasn't gonna step on a rock or something. And a strange dreamlike feeling overcame me. I looked up and saw my two neighbors already walking up beside the end of the house. In front of them, I saw another woman oddly dressed in a mid-calf blue denim skirt, knee-high winter boots, and a blue down jacket. My two companions disappeared around the corner and I followed expecting to see this third woman and wondered why she was dressed in winter gear on such a hot day. I was close enough behind them that there's no possible way for her to go anywhere else except right in front of them. There was no other woman. I looked at both neighbors puzzled and asked, did anyone else just walk around the corner, a woman wearing a winter coat? They both looked at me like I'd grown a second head and said no. We discussed it briefly, but the neighbor who lived there met my eyes and seemed uncomfortable. So I dropped the issue. Later, I discussed it with the neighbor I had walked over with, but she had not seen anything and thought perhaps I had seen someone in the distance but we both knew that that wasn't what happened because there were trees all around us and there's no distance in which anyone can see. It has been years since these things happened and I still have no explanation. Many other small things have occurred over the years that I can't explain or debunk, but these were the three most dramatic. Norwich is an old medieval city in England and has lots of beautiful and interesting old places to visit. One of its most famous buildings is the towering Norwich Cathedral, opposite Tomland, which sits down by the river Wensum. Anyhow, busy exploring my new city one Saturday, I visited the cathedral and after wandering the building, decided to explore the cathedral close. It was late, a sunny afternoon in October with lots of autumn leaves on the ground 
and I was really enjoying my walk when I stumbled upon a cobbled alley at the end of some houses and decided to see where it led. The floor and walls were cobbled and the walls maybe 10 foot high, so I couldn't see over them. But I could hear people in the gardens on the other side talking and children playing. Although I was on my own in the alleyway, I didn't feel alone. But as I began to walk on, the alley began to twist and turn. And although the sky was blue overhead, and the sun was still out, I began to feel increasingly uneasy. I could no longer hear voices coming from the other side of the walls. And when I thought about it, realized that in fact, I couldn't hear anything, no birds, no traffic, not even wind. And yet the cathedral is in the middle of a reasonably sized city. I began to feel nervous and my scalp started to prick. And so I began to up my pace, telling myself that I'd been walking a while and that the alleyway couldn't go on forever. But as I turned each blind bend, hoping to see the end of what was beginning to feel like a maze, I was only met with another stretch of alleyway. I began to jog, and although I hadn't seen anyone since entering the alleyway, and couldn't hear any footsteps on the cobbles behind me, I had the growing sensation that someone or something bad was following me close behind, and that the walls were pressing on. I started having difficulty breathing and realized I was also beginning to feel dizzy. I didn't want to pass out alone in this alleyway, and so decided to run. After what seemed like forever, I turned another corner and suddenly sprinted out onto a perfectly normal looking street down by the river, and the city sounds returned. I realized I was shaking, my hand and forehead dripping with sweat and didn't have a clue where I was. I sat down on a wall and had a cigarette and pulled myself together and then stopped to pass a by and ask for directions back to the market square in the middle of town, from where I could find my own way back to campus. It didn't take long to walk back to the market square. But when I checked my watch, it turned out that I had been in the alleyway for nearly an hour. It didn't make any sense, as I couldn't have walked that far but I didn't want to know too much about it and told myself that maybe it was all the twists and turns the alley had, and that added to the time. At class on Monday, I was telling a few people about the alleyway in the cathedral grounds and how it had suddenly turned really spooky when one of the mature students on our course who had lived in Norwich for years and knew a lot about its history overheard me. She asked me if the alley was an old cobbled one with high walls that led off the cathedral close, and I said yes. She took me aside and quietly explained to me that she wasn't surprised I'd felt what I did, because that was the alleyway they dragged people accused of witchcraft along before burning them at the stake, as Norwich has a huge history of witches. But the kicker to this story is that though I lived in Norwich for a number of years and often visited the cathedral, I never walked that alleyway again because of what happened until that afternoon one day, when a friend from overseas was visiting. I took her down to the cathedral and while there told her about the alleyway and what I'd experienced. She insisted that we walk it. And when I stalled and started to make excuses, promised me that if things started to go bad, we would just turn back and she would stay with me at all times. Reluctantly, I agreed. The alley was just how I remembered it at first, dry cobbled floor and high cobbled walls backing onto people's gardens. But after 10 minutes at most, and only a handful of turns, suddenly we found ourselves back onto the street. It didn't make any sense to me back then, and it still doesn't to this day. And I don't go near the witch's walk anymore. My grandpa was the best man I have ever met. He was like a father to me as a child, as I didn't have one of my own, or one that wasn't a psychotic Marine Corps drill instructor. He would play pranks on me as a child until my teen years. He would mess with me until the day he died, and he would try to scare me, poke my ears when I was sitting in front of him, and just play jokes on poor, unexpecting people. About two years ago, he met up with some friends 
that we lived next to in Alaska. He hadn't seen them in about 18 years, since I was a baby. My grandpa was in the army as a paratrooper, and the friends he was meeting on that day were also stationed there, and he was bunkmates. Even back then, he would pull pranks on the rest of the guys. My grandfather met them in town and had a great day. He showed them around, showed them Fort Knox and everything his little town had to offer. He took them to the mall and then out to eat. Normal friend stuff. However, there are photos that add only mystery to the story. In the photos, you can see him and my grandma side by side, and then the old neighbor's friends that he used to hang out with. But as the day goes on, you can see my grandfather's face turn from happy to sour. And in the last photos, it almost looks like he's looking into the distance and sees a ghost as he's got a terrified expression on his face. I have only seen this face when he first wakes up in the morning, pure fear. He probably has nightmares of everything he had to do while in the forces. He could never tell me, classification issues and the like. But he told me he made the mistake of looking into the eyes of the man whose life he ended and that it would haunt him forever. He had horrible PTSD and would often sleep with a police scanner under his pillow that he said it reminded him of military radios and helped him go to sleep. I thought this only brought more misery, but there's more on that coming soon. You see, my grandfather loved to smile, but that day he seemed off, looking into the distance, concerned, like he sees a ghost of some sort. A few hours after that photo was taken, he went home, sat in his favorite chair, turned on his favorite show, and told my grandma he was taking a nap, as he was feeling exhausted from that day. He never woke up. He was pronounced dead when the medics arrived. It hurts to this day, but I don't think his legacy stopped in that chair. He died at the end of March, and his funeral, fittingly, was on April 1st. Even in his casket, he looked like he was smiling, as if he was going to jump up at any moment and say April Fools and play a big joke. Even before that, when we had to confirm the body in the morgue, he looked like he was smiling and ready to jump up and mess with us. Here's where everything gets strange though. My grandma started having really vivid dreams with him, which is not uncommon for someone who just lost a loved one. After that, on their anniversary, my grandma got a phone call. The call was from my grandpa. It had his face, his number, his contact. This is coming from her. She's never lied. She said she immediately looked at his phone and that it was still plugged in above the fireplace in the living room, still had service and everything. She was so freaked out, but answered the call in hopes that she could talk beyond the grave. She said all she could hear was static. And then she heard a loud pop and the call ended. She will occasionally get calls from his cell phone but she never answers it anymore. I arrived at my grandma's house earlier this year to help her in the cleaning of the process of her house. Her house is in terrible condition since a natural spring, right where the previous owner ended his life, mind you, sprung in their basement and has flooded all the way to the stairs leading into it. The water has been pumped out, but there is black mold covering everything. The place looks like an abandoned fallout shelter that got destroyed in some sort of blast. I tried to help her dig up all the old treasures from her basement. And this was the first time going down there since my grandfather had passed away. I already had reservations about the visit because my mum told me on her visits that my grandpa will mess with her, turn off lights, close doors, footsteps and whatnot. But I never expected anything to happen to me. The house had a whole new feel to it. It felt heavy, besides being partially destroyed. Every room 
appeared to have a bug infestation of some kind, which my grandmother didn't seem to mind, as she loves ladybugs. Not even in the first 30 minutes, my grandma tells me to grab my old house slippers from my old room. She tells me they're in the top drawer and she put them in there yesterday. I wanted the slippers because my grandma had cats and those cats weren't very tidy if you know what I mean. I walk into the room, turn on the light and I open the drawer only to find that nothing is there. I open a few drawers and find old toys from where I was a kid, but no slippers. I tell my grandmother that nothing is in the drawer and my mum walks into the room and opens the drawer only to find nothing inside either. My grandmother makes her way into my room and proceeds to open the drawers. She struggles as if it's heavy and then it swiftly slides open. The drawer is no longer empty, but filled with old books, board games, toys and trinkets. And finally, my slippers laying atop of everything. My mum and I step back in astonishment. The drawer had absolutely nothing in it, but has somehow magically filled itself with everything. It almost resembled a magic trick done in Vegas. It took a while to get rid of the weird vibe I had from the magical drawer, but I did start noticing things around the house that didn't make sense in the following days. My grandmother would have things laid out that went missing, only to be found in the exact same place they were left. I found an old bottle of my grandpa's cologne in my bag. Lights would blow or turn off. The barn slash shed areas of the garage would open and close by themselves, even with the batteries taken out of the remote, and you could hear footsteps. Hear loud wind on the windows when there was no wind outside, and constantly have strange dreams. On the last night I was there, I had a strange dream that I documented. In the dream I was working on my grandma's computer, as she was walking around doing random cleaning things while my mum was on her phone, texting on the couch. We were all in the living room, and I walked into the kitchen, in the other room, only to find that the basement door had been turned into a large dining room area, and the dining room was still a dining room, but I didn't think much about it. I filled a glass of water and looked out the kitchen window into the large field behind her house. There was a car, a green car, a 69 Corvette Stingray that drove through the backyard from the driveway and parked itself in the grass. I turned around and asked my grandma if one of my grandpa's friends drove a Corvette. She walked into the kitchen with me and said, no, but looked outside with me only to find there was nothing in the backyard. She asked me what I was talking about, to which I told her about the car that had just seemed to disappear. She told me that I sounded crazy. But as I looked out the front window, I could see more cars pulling into the driveway. The first one was a teal Acura NSX. The second was a bright white color Porsche 911. And the third was some sort of red muscle car that I couldn't pinpoint. All three pulled into the backyard and disappeared. My grandma said, that the ghost of the house was messing with us, to which I replied, what ghost? So she told me about two twin girls that died in a fire in that house, that haunted and supposedly played jokes on people. We didn't even stop to think whether or not it was my grandpa. I walked into the other room and my grandma told me to come back quickly. I ran back and we heard footsteps in front of us. She told me it was the little girls trying to lead her to something. She followed them, but I went back into the other room and continued working on the computer. My mum was asking me what was going on, but hold on. Before I start this part, I do want to say that any time I'm telling this story, it happens. I will explain later. My mum asked what was going on and I tried to explain when suddenly we got a call. The caller ID said zero. We thought it was bizarre, so she answered it and hung up saying no one was there. Suddenly the house phone started next to me, 
My cell phone, my mum's cell phone and my grandma's cell phone, we all got calls from the same number. Zero. I answered them all, but couldn't remember what was being said on the phone. I remember it being important, but I don't remember what was said. I couldn't even remember what was being said when I woke up the next day. Back to the dream. My mom runs into the kitchen where my grandma is still trying to follow the footsteps that are leading in circles. I stand up and go back into the kitchen to help and just explain what happened. Suddenly everyone keeps hearing the footsteps go away and a little girl's voice laughing. We thought it was weird and my mum followed it while I stayed back and watched. As my mum walked in front of the dining room that was supposed to be the basement door entrance towards me, when suddenly a bell that was tied to a Christmas tree started moving and jingling. I told everyone to stop as soon as I heard it and told them that this wasn't two little girls playing games, but that it was in fact, my grandpa. They stopped and said, oh yeah. For some odd reason, everything stopped and I decided for some reason that I needed a new glass of water. Oddly enough, when I went to the cabinet to get some water, there was an old clock attached to the front of it. It was ticking very loudly and reminded me of my grandpa who again used to work on clocks of that nature. I opened the cabinet to grab a glass, but then when I closed it, I saw a reflection of a face behind me. I turn around. I don't remember what I saw, but I remember the dream flash orange like fire. And then I woke up. I didn't tell my family about the dream and I kept it to myself since we were pretty weirded out already. I then started working in a problem my grandma was having with her modem. While my grandma was on the phone with the internet company, she told me to come over, handed me the phone and told them to talk to me, but to listen in the background. In the background, you could hear a military radio. It was very distinct and sounded old. My grandparents lived near Fort Knox, about 50 miles away. Not enough for interference. They usually have Chinook helicopters fly by, but they are very loud and noticeable. And I do not recall any of them flying at the time. If you remember, my grandfather used to listen to police scanners all the time because it would mimic the sound of the military radio, which he used to comfort him so that he could fall asleep. Later on that day, we got home and I told my mum about what happened in the dream. As soon as I got to the part about the strange phone call with the caller ID of zero, she got a phone call, the caller ID, bunch of zeros. She told me to shut up and asked if I was playing some tech savvy joke on her. And I assured her I was doing nothing of the sort and that it was just a coincidence with the story. Or could it have been something more? Now at night, I work at a pizza place and sometimes me and a few friends from there will hang out after closing with the manager and just talk, tell jokes and stories and the like. However, I got to this story and as soon as I was talking about the phone call, my phone rang. Luckily, it was just my girlfriend wondering where I was. But as soon as I hung up, I told people about what happened with my mother and then the phone rang again. This time it was the store phone. The caller ID said unknown, which isn't uncommon where we work. And it usually means prank calls. But this was 1am on a Thursday morning. Everyone in the city knows that we're closed. I answered it, put it on speaker, and you could just hear static along with heavy breathing. I made everyone in the store take out their phones to prove that they had not made the call and all phones were cleared as the phone line kept going with the breathing. Suddenly we got more interference that sounded like police radio, but only very briefly, and then it was gone. But it wasn't heavy or an intention or the breathing. It sounded like someone was breathing out of their nose and into a mic unintentionally. My coworker asked who it was, but of course there was no reply. Then I said, Huh? And immediately the line hung up. It was chilling. And I thought it would be best if we all stopped sharing stories and just went home. 
I'm not sure what it was. Something malicious? Or, as I hope, could it be my grandfather? I also want to add that I did get a phone call while typing this out, but it was from a telemarketer. Nothing spooky, unless that is what you fear. I was born in 1984 and lived in the same house until the age of 18. My parents had lived there beforehand with my sister, who was 18 months older than me. My mum would always complain to my dad about cold spots in the house and the feeling of being watched. He just used to pass this off as her being alone and spooking herself whilst he was working. My uncle, who was in the army, came to live with them for some time before either my sister and I were born. He was younger and used to go on nights out. My mum and dad used to hear children playing out on the streets regularly in the early hours, which they thought was strange, but couldn't see anyone when they looked out. The occasion that convinced my dad about the house was when one night they were in bed and my uncle was out. They woke up to tapping on their bedroom door. They thought it was my uncle, so said to come in, but he didn't, and the tapping got louder to the point my dad got out of the bed and with a bat, went to the door to open it, to nothing. This was all before my sister and my experiences started and similar things kept happening. After we were born, they didn't stop. Another family member was sleeping in my sister's room on a pull-up bed. I woke to my sister sitting upright in bed, talking with no one. When she asked who she was talking to, she said the little girl that was sat on the end of the bed. Needless to say, that family member was spooked. I myself had had a few things, like bangs, footsteps, and two incidences stick out in my mind. One morning, I was sat at the dining table eating breakfast with my mum, and we heard my sister walk out of her room and start to come down the stairs. We could see the lower stairs from where we were sat, and they had a distinct sound, as stairs do. My mum said, here she comes, and we watched the stairs as each step was being walked on, but no one was there. We went upstairs wondering what it was, just to find my sister asleep in bed. This next story is more unbelievable. To this day, I've questioned my mum and sister as to if we actually saw this. My sister was 18. I was 17 at the time. My sister had gotten pregnant young. So we had her baby in the house now too. The baby was asleep in the cot upstairs in my sister's room and was too young to roll slash crawl slash climb like a few weeks old. We were sat at a dining table talking when we all heard and felt a massive bang. We all panicked and sprinted up the stairs and entered the room to find a washing maiden had fallen out into the cot and my niece was fast asleep in the floor under where the maiden was resting in her cot. We were so puzzled and none of us knew how that happened. After these events, we told people, and we were one day approached by a local historian who was writing a book and wanted to share our experiences in it. He also found out that our street was on a site of an old orphanage. Needless to say, he wrote the book, and we are in it, along with other ghost sightings in the area. Fast forward a few years, my parents had moved, and I'm living on my own working in a job and a new girl starts. Australia, her family had just moved to the area. We were talking one day and she started talking about ghosts. She tells me she has two dogs that won't come into her bedroom as they whine and act scared and tells me her house is haunted. I say, oh, my house was too. 
and then she tells me that her house had been written about and was in a ghost book. Turns out she had moved into my old house all the way from Australia and her room was my old sister's room. I can't tell you how much of that is too perfect for a coincidence. All of this is true and quite creepy. Because of my general interest in horror, and because they were appealing to me for a while, I collected dolls. It didn't matter what type. I had some porcelain ones, some pretty looking horror movie level dolls, that sort of stuff. They were generally creepy to the majority of people. And of course, they're haunted was a joke that I often had. But I never had an issue with any of them. In fact, I thought they were all comforting. They all had names, and I had a history of picking them out, usually from antique shops, but I had two or three from a house sale after the owner passed away. On October 28th, 2017, my parents were out of town, so my brother and I were home alone, and my dad sent me a picture of the coolest doll they found at this church thrift shop. The doll was the epitome of everything I liked. I loved clowns and circuses, and the soft pastel colors were my absolute favorite. So much so that I was writing a story at the time that reflected these interests. The doll was perfect. It felt like it was for me, like in that Coraline sort of way. But instead of looking like me, it was just something no one else could have wanted. In all honesty, I don't think my dad would buy it. But lo and behold, when my parents returned, I had a new doll to add to the collection. This was the first doll that I hadn't bought on my own or personally picked out, but I wouldn't expect it to matter. All of this happened, and I found out more things about the doll. One being that my parents bought it, and the cashier avoided touching it completely. On top of that, they said, Oh, you're buying him. Honestly, that wasn't uncommon. I'd been given a doll for free before because it was in such bad shape. One man's trash is another man's treasure. Having some aversion to a creepy doll was nothing new. Another interesting factoid about this was that my father, who is very strongly a factual person and doesn't believe in ghosts, even the slightest, said he felt this doll before he saw it. To say the least, my mum wasn't happy he went through with the purchase when she found that out. I remember vividly how excited I was to hold it for the first time. I got no negative feelings from it. This was just a doll. I do remember that one of the first things I noticed was his lack of eyes. I figured it was an old one and the eyes had fallen out. If anything, it just made me like him more. The creepy clown doll who I never named quickly found his spot on my shelf and all was well. I don't even remember when I started to get a bad feeling. It started minimally, small things like feeling uncomfortable around them or that I didn't like them facing me when I was laying down at night. I was never uncomfortable with my dolls and even when I didn't want to admit it, I wanted to be the weird girl who collected creepy dolls, but all of a sudden being around them made me anxious. I can only explain it as a deep vibrating in my chest that was nothing but discomfort to be in my room. I ignored it for the longest time, but being in that room alone was invoking an anxiety in me that I haven't felt before or since. At some point, I started having progressively worse nightmares, a reoccurring theme that they were never far from real life. In fact, they usually took place exactly where I was at the time. Whether it be my bed, the couch, they were where those nightmares would be so convincing, you'd be unsure whether you had woken up or not. I recall two nightmares in particular. One where I was laying in bed. The room was dark, but not so dark. I couldn't see anything. I was laying on my side facing away from the dolls and towards my closet. The door slowly opened, and there was a really big doll just standing inside of it. Bigger than people sized. It looked at me, but only its eyes moved. And for a moment, that's all I saw before I awoke. This was my first experience with what I can only identify with sleep paralysis. 
but I don't know if I was actually unable to move or not, or if I was just too scared of what might happen if I did. Of course, nothing was in my closet. It sounds like a cheesy nightmare for sure, but to me this was terrifying. It made it hard to breathe and made my stomach ring. The other nightmare was when I was taking a nap on the couch, and in the dream I woke up and went to my room. When I went inside, I looked at the dolls and they were moved. Then I woke up again and this repeated. Each time the dolls became more and more scattered laying on the floor or completely broken altogether. Something was moving them. It couldn't have been an accidental nudge before I awoke. It looked like something had angrily shoved them all off the shelf. Eventually I did wake up and the fear I felt as I slowly went to my room was unlike anything I had felt before. I walked as slowly as I possibly could, as if that was gonna help with anything. I was just scared of the possibility that they might have been moved. I knew that if I went in my room and the dolls were out of place, something was really, really screwed up. I turned on every light I could. I was visibly shaking with fear, but nothing was moved. It almost felt like I was being mocked. The nightmares continued for a while with no attempts to be fixed. If anything, I just made them worse. Staying awake when I definitely shouldn't have been, avoiding getting my REM cycle because due to my research, I found that's when you had nightmares, which I didn't want. I can't remember any other specific nightmare, but a lot of it was just the fear and anxiety that accompanied being in my room, being near the doll and how uncomfortable it made me. My dad even said he went in my room to get a pair of headphones and his hip, which has been broken since I was about eight or so, was suddenly full of a shooting pain. And when he left the room, it stopped. It was those small, strange encounters that made it so out of the ordinary. I would do anything to get away from that room when I could, and I didn't even realize it anymore. It was my subconscious telling me that I needed to fear my own space. It was my own subconscious telling me I wasn't safe there anymore, and I usually tried to listen to it. After New Year's is when I put all the dolls away. The night before I had decided to move all the dolls out of my room, I hadn't focused on the fear of any specific one, so I just moved them all out. That same night, I awoke and moved them back into my room. I don't know why, I just felt like they needed to be back. They couldn't be sitting out there. I just needed to move them back in. Apparently that morning I had been acting strangely and eventually my mum and I moved the dolls into a box and into the attic. After I broke down explaining to her how scared I had been feeling about those dolls lately. My mum is a very spiritual person, so she was open to helping me put the dolls away. I haven't had an issue since, but I did do some more research on the doll a few months ago. For a while, I didn't like talking about them or even thinking about them. So I hadn't even looked at pictures of them. These were all things I found out quite a while later. A few things. For one, I finally looked back on all of this and the one doll that did have eyes. In the picture my father sent me, which I needed to scroll through two years of messages to find, that doll, he had an eye. Of course, it could have fallen out during the drive I didn't doubt the possibility, but I didn't push the doll's eye out. They were gone as soon as I had him the first time. Maybe it's a coincidence, or I'm thinking about it too much. On top of that, I couldn't find any other dolls that quite looked like it. My girlfriend and I found a few online that looked similar, but they were never an exact match. The colors were all wrong, the face shape wasn't quite the same, and I still haven't found any that do resemble the doll. I even tried reaching out to the manufacturers that created dolls that I thought looked like it the most and assumed maybe there just weren't many pictures online, but I never got a way of contact. All I know is that it still deeply disturbs me when I think about that doll. Years ago, when my mother was a little girl, she would have conversations with no one. It took a long time for my grandma to finally come to terms with the fact 
that my mother had an imaginary friend. She would sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and start talking. When my grandfather would go to check on her, he'd ask her what she was doing. She'd be staring at a corner in the dark, speaking to someone they couldn't see. They are staunch atheists and don't believe in anything, not even the paranormal, and hastily brushed off any idea that she could be talking to anyone than a made up friend. Her friend was called Barry. Years later, when I was a young girl, I started speaking to someone as well, but only when I was in my grandparents' house. My grandparents by this time obviously knew that my mum's imaginary friend was called Barry. And after about the age of eight, my mother, out of the blue, just stopped speaking to him. Well, I was about four at the time. My ability to speak was coming along quite nicely, and I was insisting that I was talking to someone. Out of a joke, my grandma asks, Who are you speaking to, honey? Ari, I reply. I kid you not. My mum said that my grandparents and her face both fell into shock. She asked me again, and I repeated the same name. They all assumed it was a weird coincidence. Then my mother tried thinking back and asked me what he looked like. I described his appearance, all dark, that I couldn't see his face and that he was wearing a hat, almost like he were made of smoke, I said. My mum didn't say anything at the time, but years later, once I stopped seeing Barry, that she set me aside and asked me a few questions about if I remember Barry. When I tell her that of course I do, she said some things she remembered about him and tried to see if they were the same. We matched at nearly every point. She was quite afraid and asked a local priest to come and bless the house. I don't have any younger siblings yet, I wonder if they'll still see Barry, if they go to my grandparents' house, whatever he is. This happened in Manitou Springs. My wife and I at the time had a long commute between work and our home. We drove to the city in the daytime, came to our apartment in the evening. We had our youngest daughter at the time and were unloading some groceries. My wife saw from the corner of her eye a figure approaching. It was bizarre for her to get defensive since many tourists walked the roads we lived on, Rutan Avenue. She took our daughter inside right away, fearing something amiss. She came back out to help me and told me she felt weak all of a sudden and started pointing at this lady walking up the hill. She noticed the person did not look like someone she wanted to be in the presence of and fled inside immediately after seeing what they looked like. I, however, stayed, not knowing what I could make eye contact with. She looked homeless, which was common as a lot of people come to Colorado for the pot craze. This was different. She had a burlap sack cut in sections that almost had a weird aura, almost a memorization of confusion. Her face was scarred and deformed, she looked like she had a humpback, but possibly could have been carrying supplies. I made eye contact for the briefest moment, almost feeling an energy pushing me away. She had a staff too, and was walking very slow. I got chills, turned to grab the last of the bags, and as soon as I did, she was gone. I knew she would be there, and my curiosity struck me to see what this entity was, but she vanished poofed into nowhere, one way street with a river next to the road. I later went out to enjoy a cigarette that very night. It was two or three in the morning, very late, super dark and no lights on the street. It was a hill. So I looked up the road and noticed up in the pass in the faint distance, I could see colors changing, almost like a flame burning, but not the same colors. It was more purple, blue and black. 
I still do not know to this day what this thing was. If it was a trick, it was well played. But the street had a very dark history. No doubt in my mind, this thing could have been a witch or demon of some sort. I'm 22. And as my mum was pregnant with me, my grandfather passed away from lung cancer. The only thing he ever got me was this little clown doll that was supposed to hang over my crib. When you pull the clown's leg down, it plays a little music box star song as it winds itself back up. Now I know this already sounds like a cheesy horror story, but let's stick with it. When I was a child, maybe seven or eight, I used to have the clown hanging from the metal curtain tiebacks in my room, probably because I was too young to have read or watched it. But one night, my mom walked up the stairs and in my room while I was asleep, because the clown was playing its song, but it had its legs pulled down. Apparently, it played for about five minutes, and I do remember my mom recording it on her old flip phone and showed me that morning. We actually found out later in the day that on that night, my great grandma had passed away. So my grandfather's mum. My mum is super adamant it was her dad sending some sort of signal. But I'd be interested to know what you guys think. This is something that happened to me when I was 12. But I remember the fear I felt then quite clearly. I was visiting my dad. He lived with his fiance and her mum. I've always been very sensitive to spiritual things and they have a lot of darkness in their house. That much was clear from the moment I walk in. It was unnaturally dark inside and the air was thick and hurt my chest. I know that might seem insignificant to some people, but they also had very strange artifacts in their house. I can't explain what was wrong with them but they just gave me really weird vibes. They also had a dog, a pug named Tank. He and I spent a lot of time together and he was a very friendly dog. I never heard him bark at anyone or anything, just a really chill dog all of the time. So I think my second day staying there, my dad's fiance's mum bought me a bar of soap from somewhere. Come to think of it, I'm pretty sure she said she bought it from a secret place. It was a black bar of soap called Devil's Forest. My dad's fiance was pagan. However, I get the feeling that her mum was interested in some kind of witchcraft as well. She had unusual objects in her room, like dolls and crystals and stuff. I know that witchcraft isn't inherently bad, but I did get a particularly bad feeling from her. I thought nothing of it at the time. It was just a bar of soap. It smelled nice. And so I thanked her and put it away in my room. Later on, I was the only person at home and I was playing outside with Tank the dog. And they had a really long backyard that ended on the Brisbane River, pretty much isolated with no people around. I was walking to the end of the yard nearest to the river when Tank stopped in his tracks and started barking at nothing. It was weird because I literally had never heard him bark before I kept calling him and usually he would run right over to me, but he refused to move. I felt like he was watching something. So I went over to him to try and figure out what it was, maybe a cat or something, but he still wouldn't move and there was nothing around. He barked at an empty spot in the air and then he just kept barking. Whatever he was staring at appeared to be moving towards the house. I honestly thought nothing of it until that second. I had left the back door open and suddenly I felt really nervous, but I couldn't explain why. I just felt like I shouldn't have left the back door open. Tank barked at the door and I ran over to it. He followed me and I quickly shut it behind myself, then went upstairs and I forgot about it for the time being until I realized Tank refused to come upstairs with me where my room was. Again, he was barking at nothing. I couldn't see anything. My dad's fiance came home and was really confused as to why Tank was barking. 
I realized with a small sense of dread that Tank was barking specifically at my door, the room I was staying in. Trust me, there were a lot of things in that house that gave me bad vibes. But nothing compared to what I felt then. My dad's fiance remarked offhandedly that maybe he could see a ghost, which didn't make me feel any better, especially since I was starting to think the same thing. I stayed up late that night playing video games and everything seemed normal until quite suddenly I felt like I knew there was someone behind me. So terrified, I heard floorboards creaking and I felt like whoever was there was attempting to sneak up on me, just coming closer and closer, slowly. I could feel a shiver descend my spine, and I decided that I had to turn around, because what if someone had broken in? I was gonna scream if I saw something, because my dad's room was right there. I turn, and there was nothing. Yet I felt like there was something there, right in front of me. I just knew that something was just in my face and I wanted to close my eyes, but I thought if I opened them again, then it would show itself. It was absolutely terrifying and I ran to my room, jumped under the blankets and left the door open. I had probably the worst night in my life. The night before Tank had come and slept with me. We were together most of the time but on this night, he simply refused to enter my room. I awoke at 1am, suddenly feeling very scared. I had the feeling that if I opened my eyes, I would see something terrible. I didn't know what, just that it was going to be terrifying. I stayed under the blanket, shivering in fear, feeling very, very cold. I prayed and prayed, but couldn't shake my fear. And after hours of praying and being paralyzed by fear, I told myself the same thing I had when I thought someone had broken in. If I see something, I'll scream and dad will come to get me. At this point, anything was better than the terror I was feeling. So I worked up the courage for about another 20 minutes to open my eyes. And when I did, I didn't see anything. However, my eyes were drawn to the black bar of soap I had left on the bookcase by the foot of my bed. I had one very clear thought, get that thing out of here. I grabbed it, and since the bathroom was right next to my room, I threw the bar of soap in there and shut the door. The sound of the soap hitting the ground was what really made me think that it was possessed. It didn't weigh much, about the same as a stick of butter but the sound it made when it hit the tiles was so loud. I thought I had accidentally broken something, but I was too scared to open the door. I ran into my dad's room, realized it was 5 a.m. and that I had stayed up the whole night paralyzed in fear. He had to go to work, but I stayed in his room because I was too afraid to go to mine. His fiance gave me a teddy to cuddle, which was really nice, and I finally managed to get some sleep. An hour later, I got two calls, one from my mum and one from my best friend. At about 6am, I hadn't spoken to either of them since the previous day. They had no idea what happened that night, and both of them called me to ask if I was okay. I asked why, and they both told me that they couldn't sleep the whole night, and that they felt something terrible had happened. I was so scared I started crying. There was no way they could have known what happened. Yet, they were both up all night feeling terrified, just like me. I didn't leave my dad's room, and I kept shutting the door because it felt safe. Tank was finally with me again, and he stopped barking. I stayed there until my dad got home from work, but I was too embarrassed to tell him that I thought there was a demon in his house, and asked him to take me home. He agreed reluctantly, and while we were packing up my things, he said, don't forget your soap. And because I was feeling much less scared by now, I went and opened the door to my bathroom to get it, which I planned to throw out the moment I got home. And I remember very, very clearly that I pegged the soap to the other side of the bathroom, so it should have landed either in or near the bathtub. But when I opened the door, it was literally right there at my feet. 
The only explanation is that it must have moved to the door. I freaked out, told my dad I wasn't touching the soap, and went home that day and slept fine. But my mum and I both agreed when I told her the whole story that I wasn't going back there. Yesterday, I walked into a witch store with my friend. She was genuinely curious and practiced witchcraft. I didn't mind at all. I found it interesting to say the least. As she was looking for candles, I was exploring the store. The walls were painted black with only lights dimly lit in the store. There was a section in the back where dead animals were encased in glass jars being sold. It sent chills up my spine and gave me goosebumps. About five minutes later, I noticed that my body felt cold. It was a warm sunny day in the city. Why was I freezing? And then it felt as if something slipped into my body. It was subtle. And after a few thoughts of wondering and confusion, I forgot all about it. A few hours later at home, I felt pretty tired. It was probably just exhaustion because it was a fun day walking around the city. However, I for some reason wanted to sleep early. It was 6pm. I could tell something was off, but I pushed it aside and tried to get back to sleep. I somehow couldn't. I kept tossing and turning. Suddenly I was starving. I got out of bed and asked my mum if there was anything to eat. I ate, but couldn't chew normally. Everything seemed out of place. When I walked around, everything was in slow motion. I felt dizzy and fell to my knees. I quickly picked myself up and rushed back into bed. A few minutes later, I got up again, but this time the feeling I had was like the urge to vomit, but nothing came out. After many attempts, I had pain in my lower abdomen. It didn't feel like period cramps. It was so painful that I passed out. The next thing I knew, I awoke to see a needle in my arm connected to a tube leading to an IV. I was in the hospital. The doctor said I was fine. Nothing was wrong with my body. I also do feel fine. Right now, I'm currently sharing this and don't feel different or sick. Was there an evil spirit in that witch store that entered my body? If there was, I hope it doesn't choose to return. A few years ago, I was reading a forum and a woman said she had a haunted photograph. She said that the picture was taken of her and there was a ghost girl beside her that wasn't there when the picture was taken. More importantly, she said that anyone that saw the photo had bad things happen to them. Naturally, I had to see it. She sent me a link. It was as she described. It didn't look scary to me at all, and nothing happened to me. Eventually, I forgot about it. Not long ago, I was looking for something in my messages and came across the link to the photo. I looked at it again and spent probably two minutes staring and trying to look at the ghost girl in detail. Then I closed the tab and forgot about it. Not two hours later, my stepmom calls me to tell me my dad had a polymery embolism. He lived. On his way home, my husband hit a deer and totaled his car. And that night, my daughter got a horrible stomach bug that left us so dehydrated we had to go to the ER. I am never looking at that photo again. I'm nearly 30 now and still remember this experience like it were yesterday. I was curious to know if it's happened to anyone else in their lifetime. I was around seven years old. We had a huge two story house where most of the living rooms and such were upstairs. The garage and laundry were downstairs. The stairs themselves were quite tall. Two flights of stairs went to the top, made some form of wood, and my bedroom was the first room on the right at the top of these stairs. I was sound asleep one night, when all of a sudden I was dreaming of someone being in the laundry. Immediately following that, in my sleep, I heard this extremely loud thumping sound. Someone was running up the stairs and it was in a hurry. I awoke and I could hear it still. It was running 
and then it stopped. A moment later I heard breathing outside my doorway. My door was open, as I usually like sleeping with the door open and hallway light on. I was pretty much frozen and petrified at this point. Usually in bad dreams as a wee kid, you would call out for your parents. I was too frozen and too scared to do anything, let alone call out. I laid down and faced the wall, not wanting to move, and I could still hear that breathing. I had a gut feeling something was just sitting outside the doorway. I woke up next morning and noticed one of my figurine toys had been moved around. That was the last thing I remembered from that experience. I then started having awful reoccurring dreams in every house we moved to. These dreams lasted probably a good five to seven years and I would wake up in my dreams with my door open. I would look down the hallway from my bed and see someone sitting at the dining table. In my dream, I would do the same thing, just lay back down and pretend to be asleep. However, in the dream, this figure would always get up, walk into my room and put its hands over my face. I would always go through a motion where I would try to force myself to wake up, rolling my eyes around and the like, even trying to twitch my body or yell. This strange figure, which I could never see since my eyes were closed in the dream, would try to suffocate me with its hands over my whole face to prevent me from waking up. Has anyone ever experienced anything like this? I used to do contract security at the emergency room entrance of a downtown hospital, the graveyard shift. I would stand at a kiosk right inside the entrance and monitor access. Across from the kiosk were two sets of elevators. The first elevator on the right could only go up to the third floor. The two floors above us were administrative floors, offices only, no patient areas. So on my shift, floors two and three were closed for the night. The elevator on the left, I had to be especially trained to use. It serviced the same floors as the elevator with the addition of a helipad on the roof. This is where life flight helicopters would land with life or death patients that had to be rushed to the emergency room. Security would be notified when a life flight was en route and we'd take the elevator, use our access key and go to the helipad. On the roof floor, we locked the elevator in the open position so no one could summon it from another floor. The elevator would remain open and in position until the life flight crew had the patient inside and hit the floor one button. Security was not needed to assist the life flight crew. We would take the stairs down as soon as we had the elevator prepped on the helipad. It had been explained to me that the process was important and that people had died on the pad and even during the elevator ride down. I'm not a ghost person, I've never had haunting experiences, but that elevator behaved very oddly. Every night I worked and the right side of the elevator that only serviced the three floors would rest on the first floor. Since it served floors that were not used during my shift, it just sat there on the main floor. I was required to check the second and third floors once a night. Whenever I went to the elevators, I never had to wait for the right elevator to get to my floor because it was already there. The left elevator that serviced the helipad and floors two and three had a mind of its own. All night it would go up and down from floor to floor with no one inside. You could watch the floor indicator for it. It bounced from floor to floor all night and it would lower to the main floor, open with no one inside, close and then go to floors two, three or five, the helipad. All this activity with no one inside it. The custodial crew was done on floors two and three by 10 p.m. Before my shift even started, there was no one around to use those elevators on my shift. On my nightly checks of the floors, I never saw anyone up there. The lights were even off. Not only that, but the left elevator would go all the way to the helipad by itself. You have to have an access key to even have that option. 
The other guards had no explanation. The hospital employees obviously didn't want to be seen as believing in a haunted elevator and would change the subject or brush it off when I asked why the lift was so weird. But I would watch from the security kiosk all night as that thing would go from floor to floor or shift. It would open up on the first floor across from me and it was always empty. The other elevator that only went to floors two or three never moved unless another security officer used it. My mum suddenly passed a few months ago and within a day of her passing, my wife and I are constantly finding dimes at our feet in all kinds of strange places. Here's an example. When we talk about her, sometimes within minutes, we'll find a dime on the floor or a counter that wasn't there before. I had shoveled snow off my front step last week. And after I was done, I could clearly see there was absolutely nothing on the step as I swept it after shoveling it too. And within two to three minutes, I turned around to pick up the shovel and turned back around to see a shiny dime sitting on the step. My wife started keeping the dimes and oddly enough, some of the years coincide perfectly to the years of our births. And trust me, I'm only telling you a few stories, but there are probably at least 30 to 40 strange appearances of dimes since her passing a few months ago. Could this be significant? Recently, I had a terrible nightmare triggered by the ghost at my job. And it took me back to an event that happened in Snyder County, Pennsylvania, back between 2010 and 2015. I was between the ages of 13 to 18. Those five years were an absolute hell and tore my family apart. Many things happened at this house, ranging from violent enough to push my dad down the stairs to simple cold spots. However, the story I'm going to share is the night that stuck with me the most. In 2008, when the market crashed and people started losing their houses, my family was a part of it. I watched my parents struggle for a long time before finally giving up and moving closer to my school district where we started renting the right side of a duplex. To give a bit of an image of the house, it consisted of three stories above the ground and a basement. The first floor had a closed off porch, a large divided living room, a very small kitchen and a small closed off back porch. At the kitchen entrance was the food closet and directly across from that was the door to the basement. Upstairs were three bedrooms and a full bathroom. Every room upstairs had a carpet in it, except for my parents' bedroom at the end of the hall. Yes, even the bathroom was carpeted. Through the room closet to the bathroom, my brother's room was the door to the attic. The attic was a large room that we never used. And because it would open on its own accord, my brother pushed his dresser in front of it. But the other half of the house was an elderly lady and her daughter. The two fought almost every night. And after they moved out, they hired a man to fix up their side and sell it. Well, he invited my parents and I over one day to tell us what he had planned to work on. So he was really letting us know that it was going to be noisy for a while. He showed us a room in the basement that was painted all black with colors painted throughout it as well as candles and a Ouija board at the center. He had thrown that stuff out before we could even see it though. Now that you have the layout of the house, let me begin the event that haunts me to this day. It was a clear night on Wednesday, about 7 or 8pm. My parents were a part of pool league. So they were out that night. My brother was basically living with my cousin at the time too. So I was completely home alone with three dogs and what I strongly believe was a demon. I was sitting in my father's favorite chair. The chair faced the kitchen and I was a typical teenager texting on my phone and watching TV. When I heard what sounded like the dogs getting into the garbage out in the darker than usual kitchen. This was pretty common since our boxer Max liked to pull empty bottles from the trash if we didn't give them to him. He likes to take the lids off. 
he'd give the caps to our two chihuahuas to play with while he played with the bottle. I yelled for the dogs to get back into the living room and out of the trash. It didn't stop the sound of rustling trash bags. So I was about to get up and go out there. But I looked down and see Max laying in front of the TV, while Scrappy and Kakoa, the chihuahuas, were curled on my mum's chair that faced the stairs. Sure, this spooked me a little, but I was used to this kind of thing. It became common for things to be the ghost if it wasn't the dogs. I did my best to ignore the sound and continued watching TV. However, my attention was snapped away when the light in that half of the divided living room started to dim and brighten repeatedly and fast. The feeling of being watched heightened around this time too. But again, the being watched feeling was something I had gotten used to. I began texting my mum, asking how much longer they were going to be out. She told me it wouldn't be too much longer, but I knew it wouldn't be until way later in the night. I continued to do my best to ignore it. But then it started to sound like someone was walking around upstairs in my room and in the hallway. I was not about to go investigate on my own. As a huge fan of horror, I knew that this would be unwise. Once again, I texted my mum and this time told her that the ghost was acting up and that I was getting scared. Deciding that it was getting to be too much for me, I moved to the other half of the living room where the couch was to try and get away from whatever it was. I used to sleep on the couch, so it was already set up for me to hide under the covers. I called all three dogs with me as well as an attempt to keep us all safe. I really wish I could say that that was where the event ended and that my parents came home right then and there. Above the half of the living room I had moved into was my parents' bedroom. In their bedroom was a very heavy solid oak dresser and a just as heavy metal framed bed. I could hear what sounded like someone pushing around the dresser and bed. It sounded like someone was rearranging my parents' bedroom. At this point, I could no longer ignore everything that was happening in the house. It honestly was as if the house was coming to life. And it was at that point I called my mum demanding she come home because something was very wrong and there was nothing I could do to make any of it stop. I think the whole, it sounds like someone is rearranging your bedroom thing made her think someone might have broken in, but there's no way someone could have broken in and got up the stairs without me seeing them. Even if they did find a way onto the roof and into the house, I don't think they'd be quiet enough to make it undetected with three dogs. Either way, I had no other option than to try and hide and ignore it all. What felt like an eternity passed before my parents got home, and by the time they did, everything had stopped. Once in the door, my dad went upstairs with my mum, and I closed behind. We checked every room on the second floor, only to find no one there, and nothing had been changed or moved. Well, that was scary, but the events didn't stop there. The spectre wouldn't stop touching my mum's face one night. She said it felt like spider webs all over her and she couldn't get them off. My brother and mum were home one day and my brother said, there's nothing actually here, right? To which the thing responded by opening a kitchen cupboard and then closing it. Another night, my mum had woken up from sleeping on her chair that faced the stairs. She thought Coco was coming down the stairs, so she called for him to come and join her, but the dog was already on her lap. When she looked up, the shadow coming down the stairs was gone. Every morning at 2.30 a.m., the bathroom door upstairs would open or close. This is still unexplained because it was over carpet and it took a lot of force to open or close. My grandmother had given me a doll that would rock in a circle and play music, but you had to wind it up first. One day I was just chilling in my room, minding my own business, and it started playing on its own. The attic window would open on its own too, and we never used the attic. We never used it to the point my brother pushed his dresser in front of the door like I said before. He did it to make sure the door would stop rattling. I was relaxing in the living room one night and the mudroom door was swaying 
and me being an annoying teen shouted, could you please stop with the door? And it stopped. My mum also demanded it leave us and the dogs alone, and she heard a very clear, loud single knock upstairs. Things were quiet for a while, until the other side of the house was getting renovated, and then it came back worse than before. My dad was coming down the stairs one day, and it looked like he got pushed. He tried to catch himself, but he slid down the stairs and sliced his foot open on the radiator at the bottom. I mean, it could have been worse, I guess. One time in the middle of the day, I was just relaxing on the couch when my sleeping dog was thrown off the chair across the room with so much force, he was spun around facing the chair just as he was sleeping on it. He landed on the floor right in front of the couch. The chair was rocking so fast and hard, I'm surprised it didn't flip. The poor dog was so scared, he hid behind the toilet on the back porch. We took him out the house for a few hours, and when he got home, he hid again. My dog also used to stare and follow things that were not there. Things would go missing too. Shortly after moving in, I would hear a voice saying my name quietly and a lot, usually in the kitchen, almost as if it were a whisper. The first week after we moved in, we heard what sounded like glass breaking, but it sounded like it was outside. So we called the cops and they looked around to find nothing. I later went to use the bathroom and found the glass around the light bulb had shattered in the sink. Not a shard of glass anywhere else. This is impossible because there were four lights above the sink stretching far enough across that the first and last bulb were not over the sink at all. The last bulb should have hit the toilet if it fell. But like I said, it was the only glass around the bulb. The metal was still intact and turned on. This was the first sign of there being something wrong. My whole family fell into a depression while living there and we were constantly fighting with each other. It was never like this before we moved into that house. Sure, we all had our problems, but it was like that house escalated very negative energy. My dad tried to end his own life while living there. I tried to do the same and my brother straight up left. And I know my mum was giving up too because she just wanted to leave everything and go. I strongly believe that house or whatever entity our neighbor summoned that witch tore my family apart. About six months ago, I received a haunted doll I bought off eBay. Now I have no idea whether this thing was actually possessed, but the previous owner claimed to have several bad experiences once she purchased it from a garage sale, claiming it smashed into her dinner room set when she was doing her hair in the bathroom. Walking out with a bat to investigate, only suspecting a break-in, only to find not a single sight of anybody or anything, and the dining ware and table was untouched. The next experience she had was when she was getting ready for bed and heard a noise coming from behind the chair. The doll was sitting in and say a dark figure with red eyes glaring at her with anger. Anyway, onto my ownership. When I received the thing, I was fully aware that a possessed object may not show signs of any activity from a few hours up to a few months of being relocated. I never experienced anything. I let it sit on a shelf and collect dust, only remembering it physically exiting my house every once in a great while. I would just randomly think about it, and even when I was doing something completely unrelated or busy at the house. A few days ago, I had lit a burn pile in my backyard to get rid of a bunch of branches and logs, when for some reason, I had the idea to grab the doll and burn it to be done with it. I went back to grab it, and as soon as I touched it, my heart began racing, increasing with every step I took towards my back door. I had finally made it outside to the fire and tossed it back laying on the fire. Within seconds, it started smoking. As soon as it did, my heart stopped racing and I got relaxed. 30 seconds later, its hair and clothes were in full flames and I watched it as it began to look like something out of a horror movie. 
The eyes melted and sunk into its ceramic head, and it was converted into a charred, black soot, until nothing but the head, arms and legs were left. I let the fire keep burning until all the wood had been burnt. My main question here is whether or not it was a good idea to burn a possessed object. If it is, I don't know what to think about it. Let me know what you guys think about my decision to set the thing alight. Let me start by saying we had a good and loving mother. She put us before anything and anyone. She sometimes worked two jobs to support the six of us. She did the best she could with what she had and what she was capable of at the time. I also know she had a personal passion for spiritual growth, the metaphysical and occult sciences. I think she was addicted to the sensation of phenomenon. I think in some ways, it opened the door to the other side. It just became part of our lives and we happily were along for her journey. When I was five years old, my big toe was cut off in some bicycle spokes. My siblings were told not to put me on the back of the bike without my shoes on. I guess my sister didn't get the memo. I was the youngest of six, four girls and one boy. I slept with my sister closest to my age, but after the accident, I couldn't be in the same bed with her because I had to sleep with this thing that helped my foot stay in place and she might have moved it in her sleep and consequently hurt me. My mother made me a cozy pad with blankets and pillows next to the couch where I could safely sleep in the living room. At that time, we lived in a townhouse apartment in Hollywood, California. It had a big living room with very high ceilings. To the left was a wide arched doorway that led to the dining room and kitchen. All the way across the archway were rolls of film strips my mother got from her job and they streamed down across the doorway like beads. Straight ahead was the staircase and under the stairs in a cubby hole was my mum's desk. To the right was a really long leather couch and my bed pad running all the way up the wall to the ceiling behind the couch were huge psychedelic zodiac posters. People thought our place was groovy, late 60s, and we all saw little things here and there, nothing really scary, more odd than anything. A few times we heard running down the stairs while we were all sitting on the couch or creaking in the hall. My sister and I saw someone who looked like our grandmother standing in our bedroom doorway for a long time, just staring at us. It was too dark to see her face. My mum told me that I spoke about seeing angels and how I said that I picked her before I was born because she was what I needed for my life. I might remember bits and pieces, but that has all pretty much faded away. But this did not. My eldest sister and I were watching The Late Show in the television room. Her on the couch and I on my pad. Everyone else was in bed. I must have fallen asleep, so she turned off the TV and covered me up and then went upstairs herself. After a while, I awoke. It was so quiet. The moonlight coming through the kitchen window was shining on the film strips hanging from the dining room archway and reflected small color images on the floor. Because of this thing holding my foot still, I couldn't really move. As I was laying there, my head on my arms, my eyelids were getting so heavy. I had my arms stretched out across the floor, looking at the pretty colors from the film dancing on my little fingers. When I noticed a change, the color reflections were moving. I looked up to the archway and the strips of film were moving like a breeze hit them. I laid my head back down and watched them start to sway back and forth. Then they began swaying in sync with each other. I didn't know to be scared. They kept swaying. Then all of a sudden they stopped just like that. All of them stopped at the same time. I was very curious, 
I propped myself on my elbows, still laying on my back and tilted my head. I saw a figure behind the film casting a shadow next to me. The film strips started to separate as if someone had walked through them. It was an almost human form, but it was grey with no distinctive face. It had a male energy. I could see him as he stepped closer. I looked down and noticed he had no feet. I looked back up at him, but instead of him across from me, now he was crouching down two feet from my pad on the floor in front of me. I remember wondering why he had no light coming from him. I wasn't scared at that point. I simply didn't understand. He got even closer and I leaned over my head. I innocently looked up at him. He was way less than two inches from my face. I should feel his cold breath on my nose and drying my eyes to the point that my tears started rolling down my cheeks. And for the first time, I felt real fear. I attempted to call for my mother, but nothing came out. My heart was beating so hard and fast I could hear it. I tried to scoop my body back, but the thing holding my foot wouldn't let me. He was leaning his whole form over my little body and I began to sweat when he started making an inhumane noise. It started out like radio static, a low chuckle into a high frequency long screech, then a pain piercing into my big toe. It felt like a long burning needle going into the bone. I wet the bed with fright and I heard a loud ringing in my ears. Everything started to echo and spin. I remember seeing the room flip upside down as it all turned white and I passed out. I woke up to my mother cradling me, calling out, Baby, baby, are you all right? I guess she had a feeling, so she ran downstairs, but said that something told her to check on me. She never told me if she saw anything. There was blood coming out of my toe. The doctor said I must have ripped out the stitches in my sleep, even though I know I didn't move. My sister just recently told me after that happened, our mother had the apartment blessed, and that's why I never saw that thing there again. All I know is that she never let me sleep alone in the living room. In fact, after my toe healed, I slept with my mother from that point on, and she held my foot all night. This happened when I was about four or five. Among my siblings and cousins, we always said that my grandma's house was haunted. You could hear footsteps and whispers at night, and the back room would always be colder and would get a heavy oppressive feeling. So one day, all of the older kids went to hang out, and my parents took my grandma to run errands, so it was only me and my aunt and uncle at home. They were cleaning the backyard, and I was playing with toys in the dirt. For whichever reason, I can't remember, I went inside and went into the back room, which was my grandma's at the time. As I stood there, I remember that heavy feeling starting to creep in. There was a big window that I looked out into the backyard, and I decided to go to it. As I moved the curtain, I could see this really old trailer that sat in the backyard that was used for storage. The doorway would have only been about five feet from the window. As I looked out, I immediately noticed a figure in the doorway of the trailer. It filled most of the doorway. It was dressed in a long black dress with like a turtleneck, the dress being super black. I don't think I've ever seen such a pure black in my life. It had a bald, round wrinkly head with tall pointy ears. Think of the goblins from Harry Potter and the hands ended in long, sharp talons. All the skin of this thing was really sickly, this shade of green, and it just stood in the trailer staring back at me. Then it began to shake its head and index finger, as if to say, no, like you'd tell a little kid. After that, it slid out of view, and the heavy feeling lifted. I don't recall what I did after that, but I don't remember feeling scared more confused, I would say. I had forgotten about the event until years and years passed, when the siblings were sitting around reminiscing after my grandma passed, and my sister said 
she remembered seeing something similar. She said she also saw a woman in a long red dress and a pumpkin for a head sitting by the water fountain or bird bath. The house isn't in the family anymore, so I can't say that something else happened, but we all suspect that there was a witch residing in or around grandma's house. This happened about 12 years ago, when I was about 11. It was the day after Christmas, and my mum and stepdad and I were sitting in the living room watching TV. It was past 9pm, and my little brother had already gone to bed. Now my brother and I had gotten remote control cars for Christmas, the kind that had rechargeable batteries in both car and remote. As we were watching TV, my car that had been in the middle of the living room floor, starts making a noise like it's turned on. At this point, all three of us look at it and witness it drive around in circles twice to make a perfect three point turn, then park up against the wall. We all kind of just look at each other and my mum goes to check on my brother as he was supposed to be in bed. She comes back looking a bit concerned, saying my brother is flat out. And when he sleeps, he really sleeps. There's no faking the bear snores he gives off. So she then asks me and my stepdad whether we were playing a prank. We both deny it. My stepdad, even pointing out that the controllers to both cars had been on the side table where my brothers and I left them after playing with them earlier in the evening. My mum proceeds to check both controllers and the cars for batteries. All the batteries were in the charging docks, plugged into the wall, and we had run the batteries out while playing with them earlier. My mum, brother and I had some strange experiences in this house, but this was by far the strangest I have ever experienced personally. I can't think of a logical explanation for this. I've always thought, perhaps, it was a ghost. I was living in the Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia, last year. I was there to get some English certificates and take a break from law school. I lived in a neighbourhood that's not really well regarded by most people there. It's called Southport. Coming from a third world country, I was pretty sure I could handle myself, which is pretty secure compared to where I live. Before telling you guys my stories, I feel like I have to explain why the place is thought to be dangerous by most. Southport is close to Labrador, another neighbourhood, and those parts of town are well known to have a lot of drug addicts. They tend to move into abandoned places and turn them into crack houses. At least, that's what you hear. However, I think the people that tell us those things are actually trying to scare foreigners a little bit, just to make sure we're more aware of our surroundings. I mostly heard this from my teachers back in school, where I took training for my tests. So now for the first story. Most nights I would go out with my friends to hang out at Surfer's Paradise. So my daily routine would be school in the morning, and then I would go to my part time job go back home, work out, shower, and go out and have some fun. But one day, for whatever reason, I decided to grab some takeout at a nearby restaurant and stay home to watch Netflix. We had this burger restaurant about 150 meters from the back door of the building I lived in. And this door led to a somewhat dark street where you couldn't see a lot of activity at night. It was around 8pm when I left to grab the burger and then went straight back home. But as I was returning from the stall, I got this weird feeling that someone was walking behind me, which made me turn around. At that moment, I saw a guy wearing a red hoodie crossing the street. After that, I began walking faster. A few moments later, I started running to my place, thinking it was one of the crackheads that lived nearby. I must have been about 20 feet from the same back door I mentioned earlier, and I saw that weirdo run towards a garage gate and disappear. 
I couldn't believe what I saw. I didn't hear any noise from the guy trying to jump the aluminium gate, as it would have made a really loud noise for sure. That's when I decided to go back and check out what had happened. I left my food close to the door and started running towards the gate. When I got to the expected gate, there was an electric fence above it, which meant the guy couldn't have jumped over it. And also, I must have run back there and not even 10 seconds later he was gone. There was no way he could have opened that gate without making a noise. He simply vanished, and I'm still unsure about what I saw. This other incident is a little scary. It was my day off, and I decided to buy some stuff at the nearby supermarket in the afternoon. On my way there, I crossed paths with this old man. He was wearing a black fedora and a red button up shirt, had really dark skin and a strange mustache. He also had a cane, which didn't seem to have much use because he was walking pretty fine. When I passed by him, I felt like I got electrocuted, and for a moment, my arms felt numb. I wasn't really sure what happened, but it was bizarre. In any case, I just carried on going. A number of years ago, me and my boyfriend went on holiday to Mexico. We were looking around the pyramids on one of our tours. And as we're getting back to our hotel, my boyfriend sneaks me off to the side away from the tour guide and shows me something he has in his pocket. By his face, he had been itching to tell me for a while. I thought he'd been acting funny. And that's when he pulls out a small rock. I look at it without much interest and go back to hearing the tour guide when he pulls me over again and says, listen, I got this from the ruins. I give him a puzzled look. Why would you do that? I say. I thought it was really cool to have a piece of history with us forever. We can put it in our house. I give him a faint smile. I wasn't really sure why he decided to take a random rock home, but I didn't think it was such a terrible thing. Anyway, that night, I had the worst dreams ever. I dreamt that I was seeing my closest friend, Abby, with only one arm. She was trying to tell me something, but it was like she was underwater, frantically waving her arm and stump. And I woke up in a cold sweat and it really freaked me out. I called her up back home but she was still asleep. Figures. I tried going back to sleep, but there was a deep-rooted sense of fear in my gut, and something was preventing me from sleeping with ease. I tossed and turned, and then my boyfriend poked me in the side. I instantly turned and asked him what was wrong. He said he had a horrible dream that my friend Abby only had one arm. This freaked me out a little. I hadn't said anything out loud. Even when I tried attempting the call, I didn't leave a voicemail or a message of any kind. There was no way he could have known or heard me. I brushed this off as a simple coincidence, but for the next three nights, I didn't sleep well, and a general feeling of unease overcame me. We had a few days left of the holiday still, and one afternoon, as I was sitting up in my room, waiting for room service as I wasn't feeling all that well. Did I see a shadow? About half the size of a normal person dart from our bed to the bathroom. I was reading a book at the time and I just about crapped myself. I don't move, feeling completely vulnerable. I just stare at the corner where it went towards the bathroom and listen and wait. Minutes pass, and with trepidation, I scoop myself off the bed and look past the corner. There's nothing there, no one to be alarmed about, and I start to get scared. That's when I see the rock my boyfriend took from the ruins. It's just on the glass table in front of the TV, and I wonder, all of this started when he brought the rock. 
Could it be? I go downstairs to rejoin my boyfriend a little while later and start speaking to him about the rock and asked him what made him want to bring it. He confessed he just thought it was cool and would be something fun to show the lads. I gave him a snort and went to speak with the bartender and get another drink. We started a conversation and I steered it towards culture and history, and then finally towards the ruins. I wanted to be subtle. Then I said that I heard of the people that took objects from ruins like rocks and stuff. His demeanor changed from the happy, pleasant tone we were conversing in prior. And he looked at me and said, did you take something from the ruins? No, I said, lying through my teeth. Good. They say that those who take from the sacred sites are haunted by a Lucius. I asked him what this funny word meant, and he said that in Mexican culture, they are these tiny dwarf-like spirit things that can drag your soul to the ground and kill you if you're not careful, but they are not to be trifled with. I understood them to be somewhere between a ghost and a bogeyman, but I took his warning very heavily, as I had seen something half the size of a man earlier that day. I told my boyfriend later in the evening that I was having misgivings about him having taken the rock, and convinced him that the best thing to do would be to return it. So he begrudgingly agreed, and we took the same tour again albeit with a different tour company to not be suspicious, and he returned the rock exactly where he found it. I'm happy to say the rest of our vacation was spirit free, and the feeling of unease lifted. Whether the feeling was in my mind or not is another matter, but I know that I saw that shadow dart from our bed to the bathroom, and it's something I'll never forget. Don't go pilfering sacred sites, people. You never know if you might bring more home with you than you expected. My great grandmother, Emily, owned a house on Glenwood Avenue in Owosso. She was fairly well off. So she let my mum's mother move into her house when she was falling on hard times with her husband and their kids. And my great grandmother, Emily moved out. I'm going to try to make this as easy to understand as possible to who is who. So I'm going to lay out who moved into the house first. My grandma Pat, who is my mother's mother, has three kids, Charlotte, my mother, Chris and James. She was married to a man called Butch, who also had three kids, Sandy, Lee and Greg. These are all events that my mum and grandma Pat both separately told me throughout my life. I'm 22 now and have told my friends about them through the years. I've been hearing these stories for a while and think it's time to share these experiences. I want to give a bit of information about my great grandma, Emily, when she lived there. She told my grandma that some strange things had been happening in the house when she was in bed. It felt like a cat walked over her and she had no animals. She told my grandma that something would tug her blanket at the end of her bed when she would have to clutch onto it to keep it there or it would be pulled off. Water would also run in the bathroom constantly and she would have to get up and turn it off throughout the night. My mum moved into the house and she made some friends around the neighborhood. They would tease her about how a witch lived there before and did witchcraft in the basement and said the house was haunted. My mum brushed it off thinking they were trying to scare her. My mum said, that her and her stepsister Sandy shared a room, and she said that red glowing eyes would look at them in the closet. My mum said they would be so scared that they would sleep in the same bed, and Sandy even ran and flipped on the light and moved the toys around in the closet, thinking it was just a light. But as soon as the light would flick back off and Sandy got back into bed with my mum, they would reappear. My mum told me that they would pull long black hairs from the drywall leading to the staircase and that the drywall would literally just crumble. 
She also told me that one night my grandma Pat was waiting for her husband Butch to get home. She was watching TV in the living room and she was laying on a pull out bed. She sat up to get a drink of water and had her feet on the floor and something grabbed her ankle and squeezed. It shook her so hard from underneath the bed that it left a bruise. She looked under the bed thinking it was one of the kids and she saw nothing was there. So she yelled for my mum to come out with her until her husband got home. She told my mum what happened and they were both terrified. I asked my grandma about this and she told me the exact same thing. My grandma also told me that she'd seen large black figures in the home multiple times. I just got off the phone with my grandma to try and get everything as accurate as possible. She didn't have much time because she was at work, but she did tell me that a man hung himself in the basement and that she would see things in the kitchen a lot, like large black figures. The basement door was in the kitchen. She said that my mom would too, to the point that she would scream and cry multiple times from the ages of two and a half and told me that they moved out once when my mum was younger because of the weird stuff that was going on and someone else moved in for a while, but they had to move back several years later, which was when she was grabbed from under the bed. She said something grabbed her by the ankle and shook the hell out of it. My great grandmother Emily owned the house the entire time, which is why they ended up back there. She also said that her son James had seen the red glowing eyes and all of the other kids would hear and see things constantly. But after things got physical with her and it grabbed her ankle, she got out of there for her own good. She also said that renters wouldn't stop moving out of the house very quickly until someone purchased it years later and it had been blessed. She thinks they're still living there to this day. When I was around 15, my mum told me about this again because it was so scary and interesting to me. I would have my mum retell me everything that happened in the house all the time. And I ended up finding the house online while I was searching through articles to see if any information was available about it. I found that right down the street was Rosevare Park and Woods and is said to be one of the most haunted places in Owasso. I'm not sure if it has any correlation with the house, but I just thought it was strange. We were in my daughter's room going through the whole bedtime routine. My wife sat on the bed brushing my daughter's hair to put it in a braid while I stood around waiting to tuck her in and say goodnight. While waiting, I commented on a collectible 2010 holiday Barbie doll still boxed that was given to my daughter by our neighbor. I was curious to know if she had taken it out of the box and my wife replied that yes, she did because dolls are meant to be played with. To that comment, I mentioned to my daughter that both her mother and I had collectible dolls tucked away in our closet, each of them still in boxes and never opened. These were a Bruce Lee action figure and a Jesse the Governor Ventura doll and a 95th anniversary collectible Raggedy Ann doll. As I said this, my wife quickly corrected me and said no, that it's a Cabbage Patch doll that she owned and that one of them would tan well. Having just reorganized my closet one day before, I was pretty sure it was a Raggedy Ann doll, but my wife swore up and down that she never owned such a thing. Curiosity got the best of me. And so I pulled the box out of the closet and brought it back to the room to show her. As I held it up, my wife stopped brushing my daughter's hair and slowly shook her head and trying not to scare my daughter mouthed the words, it's not mine, I've never seen it before with a very serious look in her eyes. My wife has an incredibly sharp mind and a memory that sometimes terrifies me. So I know she wasn't trying to pull my leg. I asked if it might have been given to her by her sister, but a quick phone call confirmed that her sister had not. She once did, however, give her a collectible Mary Poppins doll, which both of them remembered. So here we are now in our home, a doll for which we have no idea where it came from. I thought I had chills already running down my spine at that point 
until I realized the doll was coincidentally the same as Annabelle, the haunted doll, which spawned horror movies and are now kept in the Ed and Lorraine Warren Occult Museum. It's probably nothing, but seriously, we freaked out. My wife does have a Cabbage Patch Kid tucked away in another closet, but it's not this one. There's a very strong presence in our home, and it was here last night. Let me give you some backstory. It first started three months ago. Our four-year-old's first night here had an imaginary friend, and he's never had one before. I remember specifically feeling the presence before he started talking to seemingly no one. Frightening. It was like whoever this was was minorly playing with him. A small interaction. But at one point I heard him ask, do you want something to drink? And then proceeding to bring me a drink and ask me to open it for him. I watched. He never took a drink of it. Our thermostat would somehow be changed when my boyfriend would be back here without me. His coffee pot also kept getting shut off by the switch at the back. It wasn't me doing it, and our child couldn't reach. I at one point even paid $13 for a list of previous people that lived here to search for obituaries. It came up empty. We live in the state of Oklahoma, so you're allowed to not disclose to tenants if someone has passed away there. Two months of living there, whatever this thing was definitely started to show a stronger presence. It often appears childlike, but at other times it does not. Things get turned off quite often. The fan, the TV, our speakers in our bedroom, things fall off the wall a lot. It could be a coincidence, but it usually happens only on the nights when my boyfriend and I are together. I've tried to pay attention to the patterns. There have been a couple of points where it sounds like there's someone rolling a ball across the attic. My boyfriend experiences a lot of sounds. He'll be in the shower before I'm home from work and have to get out because he thinks he hears our son crying or screaming at times. I also see shadows, shadows you can't see through, more of a dark figure. I often feel as if someone is peeking around the corner looking at me, and when I look, something moves so fast, my eyes barely catch a trace of it. Throughout the last three months, we've both also been experiencing terrible dreams, so vivid, so real, all nightmares. We even once burnt sage, Everything calmed down, and I felt as if this was when the entity started showing itself to me more as a child. In the now, we had been talking to a friend on the phone about this, and she was stressing her concern about how it seems as if this is something very dark. The dreams have been persistent since we began speaking to her. I feel as if this is angry, like it's been called out. Things keep falling off the wall while we're sleeping. I also felt as if something kept making my dreams go dark, and I would wake up with a jolt, and one time could feel such a strong presence that I couldn't move. Also, our son's teddy bear has vanished into thin air. He hasn't taken it anywhere and it's not here. I've searched the house from top to bottom. The cars, the garage, around the house. It simply isn't here. Not to mention, the attic is one of the closets that it's screwed shut. All of the carpets in the house are old. There's even carpet in the bathroom and kitchen. But there's new carpet, funnily enough, in the bedroom closets. I'm not sure what this entity is or what it wants, but I don't think its intentions are as innocent as it makes out. My dad passed away when I was 11. Every summer we went to a little town which had a porcelain doll museum. I loved going there, hanging out with my dad and had several dolls myself. But the one I loved the most was one that resembled an Indian girl with two braids. 
I kept it on a shelf that was facing my bed, pushed it to the corner, and I had it for three to four years. I didn't even touch it, I only admired it. Well, as I mentioned, my father died in December. Fast forward half a year later, it's June, summer holidays, and I'm laying on my bed with my laptop, chatting with my friends at midnight. Both my door and window were open, but it was quiet outside with no wind, and the doll suddenly fell to the floor. I was startled by the noise, but confused since it didn't shatter. The shelf was 1.7 meters high, so I turned off the light, covered myself in a blanket, and went to sleep, hoping I could. The next morning, the doll was still on the ground face down. I started to think how it could fall. It was protected from wind, although there was none, and a 40 centimeter empty space in front of it. I got up shaking and slowly approached it. I sat on the floor and picked it up. It was intact, except for one thing. The left braid was cut in half, not torn, cut. I quickly put it away and never touched it again, nor even took a look at it. I still don't really know what happened. I tried to think it was my dad comforting me, but as I grew older, that didn't seem logical. Why would my dad, who loved me the most, try to hurt my favorite doll? This takes place in La Pateca, which is a rural area just south of Monterrey in Mexico. When I was a little girl, we always had legends of the witches in the wild. Don't go out alone. Don't stay out so late at night. If you do, the witches will come and take you away. My mama would tell me and my brother Armando every day. Mama would not let me or Armando go anywhere unless it was both of us. And the furthest we could go was the little store a mile away when we needed groceries. We were not well off with money, so we had to walk everywhere. When Armando and I got done working the fields, Mama would let us play until it was nighttime. Sometimes we would play tag with our friends. Sometimes Papa would chase us around or take us exploring in the woods. The exploring was fun because we got to see animals, but we also saw the little old huts where the witches lived. Everyone called them the witches because they were weird and would constantly do black magic and talk to themselves. One day, Armando and I were playing alone because Papa was tired from working on the field all day and Mama was making supper. We went to the woods and started to explore, but we went too deep and got lost. I cried and cried because I wanted Mama, but nobody heard us, so we kept walking around. After a little bit, an old lady heard us and said she would help us. No, you're a witch and you're going to take us away, yelled Armando. No, no, mijo. I know where your mommy and papi are, she said. I cried and told Armando that I wanted to go home. So he gave up and told the lady to help us. Okay, follow me. After a while, she took us to a house we didn't know, but said Mama and Papa were inside, so we went. Without thinking, we went in, and the lady suddenly grabs us and starts carrying us, screaming, into another room. She threw us in and locked the door. Armando kept banging on it and yelling to let us go, and I just cried and cried. It was quite quiet. But I thought I kept heard her saying, Glory to God. He has given me pure blood of the innocent. With this, I'm going to seek my revenge against those who have done things to me in the past. I don't exactly remember how much time passed because I was tired after crying for so long. According to Papa, we were not home. So he went around town looking for us until he came into the woods to look. He said he stopped at the house where we were at because something made him look there. When Papa called out to the house inside, the witch kept yelling at him to go away, but he said he thought he heard Armando, so he broke in to look around. He found us and said he heard banging, which showed him where we were. When he found us, he hugged us and took us away, telling her that if he ever saw her near the house again or the kids, he would end her. 
Mama was crying so hard when we saw her that it made me cry again. Papa yelled at us for being dumb and going out so far, and Armando just looked at the floor. After that, Mama didn't let us go out anymore without her or Papa until we were teenagers. Every day I thank God for not letting me and Armando get into more danger that day. I do not know what the witch wanted to do to us, but I don't think I want to know either. There's no two ways around this. I'm pretty depressed. Crap stuff happens and there's not anything you can do to stop time's march. I get it. Recently, I've been in a slump, not leaving bed for a long time, apart from getting junk food and using the bathroom. During this time, I've started seeing faint faces and images, flashes for a second in my vision. Not the usual shadow people. I've just been chalking this up as my brain being exhausted, so I'm not counting it as anything. This is what messed me up though. I've been starting hearing my dead cats meowing at me. My beloved cat died away from me. And if I had waited one more night to send her to the animal hospital, she would be with me. And it really crushes me even just typing this out. I know it's not really my fault, but I can't help these thoughts. She had a very distinct meow. And for the last few days, I keep hearing her. See, I chalk this up as being exhausted, except my cat and dog hear it too. I was in bed with the dog on me and the cat on the windowsill when I heard a faint meow from below the bed. The cat shot up and froze. The dog perked his head up and growled. I had the dog check under the bed before me because I'm a coward, but there was nothing there. I cry every time I hear the noise and maybe that's what's driving it to continue. I'm extremely frightened because of this. I think the activity is getting worse. I'm huddled in my bed right now and I don't dare look above the covers like a child. Whatever is in my house knows what scares and upset me. And I don't think it wants me to feel happy. Maybe it's come to collect me. Who knows? Anyone with any explanation, it would be much appreciated. I'm currently 17 and live in Victoria, Australia. I'm a major believer in the paranormal. Let me explain my predicament. My family and I just moved into a rental house about two months ago and have been noticing a shadow out of the corner of our eyes. It started off in only one place where we'd see it pass by one window. This was interesting to me because several of my family members said they seen the same thing. And when we decided to finally talk to each other about it, we discovered that we'd seen similar things. At first we shrugged it off. That was until I had my own personal experience. My older brother and I had been sitting at the dinner table. The table is right next to the kitchen bench for reference when we saw a shadow of a head out of the corner of our eyes poke up. So it was just sticking over the bench. But of course, when we'd look over there, there'd be nothing. Now, we have two dogs that are in the house. And at first we thought it was one of them. That was until we realized one was in the room with my sisters. And the other was asleep at our feet. That freaked us out a little, but whatever. It wasn't giving off a bad vibe. So we continued with whatever we were doing. Before we decided to head off to bed, we actually saw it a few more times. My personal experience comes after when we finally decided to go to bed, probably around midnight. I'd gone to the bathroom after putting the other dog in my room as one dog is with my sisters and one is with me. Now, where the sink is situated in the bathroom is at the opposite end to the door. So you'd have your back to the door when you wash your hands. 
I'd finished washing my hands and turned around to locate a towel or something to dry them with, when I saw a shadowy figure walk past the doorframe. Me, being in a kind of curious daze, while keeping my head straight, walked very slowly to the doorframe which leads to a small doorway, and once I'd reached the opening, I could see out of the corner of my eye. It was so close that, if I'd have slightly lifted my hands, I would have touched it. But of course, once I looked directly at it, it's gone. After the encounter, I hadn't seen it in almost two weeks. I'm not sure if it's bad or not. But does anyone know what this could be? Because I'm a bit freaked out. I don't know what's been happening, but everything has been weird in our home lately. My cousin said it was probably a ghost joking, but it got me thinking. Everything in our refrigerator has been expiring and is full of mold. Nothing was supposed to expire until the end of next year. And yes, our refrigerator temperature is fine. It's 36 Fahrenheit. The dishwasher was full of maggots as well, which almost caused me to vomit. I've been hearing soft footsteps lately in the living room when I'm home alone. The walls are soundproof as well, so it can't be my neighbors. And I have two cats, but they're always in my bedroom. Even my cats, for God's sakes, have been hissing and running away from the pantry when I open it. I removed all the bags and food, which caused them to get even more scared. This all started about two weeks ago when my mother brought antique dolls at the thrift store, which yes, I know is a stretch to even think they're haunted. And it might be a coincidence, but I'm not taking any chances. This might all have been something to do with those dolls. I don't really understand why this is happening now. I'm very uncomfortable in my own home. We can't move out. We can't afford anything like that at the moment. I just want to know what is going on.